Hey everyone, this is chapter 9 of Rethinking the Industrial Revolution, Five Centuries of Transition from Agrarian to Industrial Capitalism in England by Michael Andrew Zmolik. The title of the chapter is Capital and Industry. Quote, I sell here, sir, what all the desires to all the world desires to have. Power. Matthew Bolton. Footnote. This is a ubiquitous quote prominently on display at the London Science Museum, visited by author the author, Michael Andrew Zmolik. 1997. There is much that could be read into this quote from Bolton. The steam engine provided a, a much improved source of motive power that would revolutionize industry and break the factory's dependence on the water wheel, but it does not seem as if Bolton were talking only of power in the form of energy. Ownership of a steam engine also implies a good measure of social power. Does that power come from the machine or from the fact of property ownership? The answer we offer, as might be expected by now, is that since the purchase of a steam engine required capital, and since the application of the steam engine took place within factories, where we could define the relation between the owner and employee as a social relation of capital, then it follows that the power of capital proceeds and is a necessary precondition to the application of the power of the steam engine. In this chapter, we turn to the inquiry of the social property relationship that is capital. In the conclusion to chapter 7, we argued that capitalism as an economic system involves more than policies promoting government laissez-faire that what makes capitalism is the social relation of capital, which could be said to exist when all the factors of production are in possession of the owner slash employer, who in response to competitive market pressures, making the transformation of production an imperative, is able to treat the factors of production as abstract inputs into the production process in pursuit of a profit that accrues solely to the owners of the means of production. In order to set the stage for the remaining chapters, where we trace the long struggle between workers resisting imposition of capital in manufacturers and capitalist employers seeking to impose it and turning to the state for assistance, this chapter will consider the emergence of the capitalist entrepreneur, the sources of investment capital, and different understandings of the definition of capital. First, however, we shall continue our review of the different sectors of the British economy as they were transformed by the Industrial Revolution. By turning to those lines of industry that were in general less well developed along capitalist lines, starting with textiles other than cotton. Woolens and Worstead Several factors explain why the woolen trades Long the staple of British exports took a back seat to cotton at the end of the 18th century. The key difference between the cotton industry and the woolen and worsted industries was, of course, that the latter were regulated, while the former was not. While the guilds had long disappeared, workmen's combinations in the woolen trade, combers, carters, weavers, fullers, and shearmen, or, quote, croppers, end quote, as they were known in West Riding, were well organized in the late 18th century and could mount serious resistance to any perceived threats to their occupation. Solving the technical difficulties of adapting machinery to processing wool also proved difficult in certain lines of production, and this contributed to the delay in industrializing woolens. Woolen production involved no less than 34 steps between the sorting of the wool and the folding of the finished cloth. The spinning jenny was adapted 
to spinning the shorter fibers of woolen cloth not long after its introduction. Being a machine that basically expanded the number of threads the spinner could spin at once, it was well suited to the domestic pattern of work in Yorkshire and was quickly and easily adapted to household production. Quote, far from favoring the progress of capitalism, end quote, writes Manto. Quote, the Jenny seems to have provided the smaller, the small master with a new weapon with which to safeguard his independence. This was the secret of its success in a country which was, above all others, the home of small-scale industry, end quote. Manto, 1961. But the Jenny was found unsuitable for spinning the long-fibered wool required for making warstead. Footnote. The making of wool cloth came in two primary forms, woolen and warstead. Woolen cloth is made from loosely spun short-fibered wool, which gives the final product its high nap and bulkiness. The fuzzy, bulky woolen blanket provides a good example. Named after Englishman Thomas Blanklet, B-L-A-N-Q-U-E-T-T, -T, who apparently, quote, invented, end quote, it in the early 14th century, the woolen blanket became a staple product of the woolen industry of West Riding. Worstead cloth is instead made from long fibered wool spun into yarn that is smooth and compacted, making for a napless, tightly woven cloth such as that used in suits. Arkwright had engaged in experiments to adapt the water frame to wool spinning without success. End footnote. Each of the regions of woolen and warstead manufacture had developed a different form of organization. Warstead, which takes its name from the town of Warstead, Norfolk, where it was produced as early as the 13th century, made steady progress from the late 17th century. In Norwich, the trade was less centralized and centered on the weaver. In the West, England, in the West of England, production was centralized around the gentleman clothier. The same was true of the Warstead trade in West Yorkshire, but in the woolen-producing region of West Yorkshire, as we have seen, the small clothier and the gentleman merchant were predominant. In Wales and Scotland, it was the spinners who did the putting out of any work they could not do themselves. By the 18th century, rapid changes were taking place in the woolen and Warstead trades. Norfolk had been complaining about competition from Yorkshire since the 1740s. After 1750, Yorkshire began to differentiate from the other regions. Woolens and Worstead from Yorkshire counted for about a fifth of total exports in 1700, about half in 1770, and about 60% by 1800. This rise to preeminence is remarkable given that Yorkshire, quote, had few natural advantages in transport, raw material supplies, and the price of labor there were none, end quote. Wilson, 1973. Roads were poor, wool was in short supply, and after 1750, Yorkshire had no advantage in terms of labor costs. What Yorkshire did have were fast-flowing streams well suited for turning water mills. Much of West Riding was still unenclosed in 1750, and this meant that workers in the widespread woolen and warstead trades also enjoyed access to land as a supplementary means of subsistence. This gave a strong underpinning to the artisanal structure of employment where domestic manufacturing was predominant in the woolen trade. Production itself was mainly carried out by, a, by small master manufacturers who did the weaving and whose family carried out the spinning and scribbling, though these could also be put out. Fullers cleaned and prepared the cloth before the small master took them to the cloth hall, where gentlemen merchants bought the unfinished cloth put it out to finishers, and then sent it to market. The system here was thus centered on the gentleman merchant, who by virtue of being unencumbered by the production process, did not have to share his profits with a, quote, factor, end quote, or middleman. This, quote, benefited the entire industry, for it ensured that the merchants could always pay on the nail for the cloths they bought in the cloth holes. Thus, the master clothier saw a quick return on his investment in wool and labor and was able to continue production, requiring much lower levels of credit than a minor producer in the west of England would have needed. <laughs>
This rapid circulation of capital was without doubt a major reason for the vitality of the West Riding wool industry. End quote. Randall, 1991. The advantages of better organization and more rapid circulation of trade had been cited as perhaps the key factor to explain West Yorkshire's exceptional growth. There is much more to the story than this, however. Broadly speaking, cloth production here was separated into two regions, both characterized by, quote, the ubiquity of freehold as opposed to copyhold tenor, end quote. Footnote. What appears to account for Yorkshire's, quote, growing supremacy, end quote, is the active role played by merchants in towns such as Leeds and Wakefield versus the more passive or absentee role of London merchants monopolizing and placing restrictions upon the Norwich trade. End footnote. A Warstead-producing region west of and including Bradford and Halifax was characterized by poor soils, prevalence of husbandry, early enclosures and proletarianization, partible inheritance, and, as noted, the dominance of the merchant clothier engaged in putting out operations. Here, enclosures of waste for sheep farming in the 16th and 17th centuries had weakened material custom, excuse me, manorial custom and increased social polarization between large freeholders and leaseholders on the one hand and small cottagers and landless persons on the other. The increased market dependency of the majority of the population encouraged the spread of putting out operations. The woolen-producing region within and around Leeds, Huddersfield, and Wakefield retained its, quote, mixed, end quote, character and was characterized by better soils, mixed farming, late enclosures, and prevalence of the independent small clothier or a, quote, artisan, end quote, structure of work organization. The independent clothier of this region typically had a, quote, reasonably sized farming plot and a fairly viable dual occupational structure, which cushioned him against years of bad trade and supported the accumulation of capital, end quote. Hudson. The Industrial Revolution played out quite differently in these two zones of production, which seems to have contributed to the exceptional pre-factory growth and output in both regions as a combination of high population growth comparable to the exceptional prevalence of freehold tenor, in turn facilitating the growth of towns under civic control which established their own national and international trading networks. In imitation of the growth of London, the towns of West Yorkshire increasingly operated as centers of credit and finance and as wholesale markets for food from East Yorkshire. While the local population was increasingly dependent upon manufacturing as a source of income, and excuse me, not in, uh, <laughs> while the local population was increasingly dependent upon manufacturing as a source of income, the greater reliance on foreign markets made the Yorkshire trade more vulnerable to serious fluctuations in demand. While the woolen industry experienced developments in the direction of industrialization before 1790, the nearly two-thirds of all woolen mills built in Yorkshire after recession in the years of 1778 to 81, the volume of trade tripled between 1783 and 1792. Jenkins and Potting, 1982. Since the 13th century, flowing mills had provided a service to paying clothiers who paid monopoly prices to the landlord. Hudson, 1986. The advent of the Industrial Revolution brought about a bottleneck in fulling, leading to the establishment of new fulling mills. There were 104 in Yorkshire in 1780 and 197 by, 19, excuse me, by 1800 by which time most fulling mills housed scribbling and carting machinery. Excuse me, scribbling and carting machinery. The slubbing billy and the scribbling engine, machines that prepared the fibers for carting, had come into general use in the 1780s. Slubbing, slubbing was a step added to, excuse me, added by the introduction of mechanized scribbling and carting, and thus met little resistance as it did not displace an existing workforce. In the woolen-producing district of West Riding, 
The scribbling engine provided the main stimulus for the conversion of corn mills. The addition of such engines to fulling mills or the building of new mills. The number of new mills increased from 36 to 243 during the 1790s. Typically, new mills using scribbling engines were located alongside streams so that they could be run by water power. One such mill located alongside the River Air was built by Joseph and John Wainwright at Armoury Mill near Leeds. Footnote. There was a fulling mill on this site as early as 1590 known as Casson Mills, named after the owner Peter Casson. The mill would later be added to Benjamin Gott's industrial empire after 1805 and with Gott's new buildings would become the largest woolen mill in the world, conveniently located alongside the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. Armley Mills Museum outside Leeds visited by the author in October 1997. End footnote. As a result of this expansion, thousands of domestic scribblers were put out of work, their outsourcing trade being displaced. At the same time, the establishment of, quote, company mills, end quote, operating on a cooperative basis was seen. Quote, the company mill performed the fulling, scribbling, carding, and slubbing processes, some including dyeing and some of the latter ones also did, gag, r- excuse me, did rag grinding and spinning on commission, end quote. Hudson, 1983. Quite unlike the initial effects of the Arkwright system on cotton spinning, the cooperative, quote, company mill, end quote, did little to disturb the structure of production in the central woolen region of West Yorkshire. Weaving and spinning continued to be conducted in domestic workshops and garrets, except where domestic workers were brought into mills where the employer could oversee the quantity and quality of their labor. There were some larger mills that appeared in the region before 1800. Benjamin Gott and his partners would establish his mill at Beaning in 1792, which, quote, by the late 1790s had 38 scribbling and carding machines, but the average number of machines per mill was probably nearer to six or to eight, end quote. Gott, who started out as a merchant, became mayor of... Hey, Dad. I'll be out in a minute in 1799 and died a millionaire was the exception to prove the rule in the woolen districts of west yorkshire it was generally the smaller clothier who provided the basis for the slow but steady growth of the factory system by accumulating enough capital to purchase machinery to start a private spinning or weaving mill whilst being able to pay into the operations of a company mill for his quote outwork and quote remain competitive in the Worstead districts, the Worstead Mill was started in 1787 at Addingham, and a small number of water power mills, some combining cotton spinning, appeared in the early 1790s. As spinning mills, these were typically much larger than the woolen mills. Unlike the Jenny, the water frame was found unsuitable for spinning the short fibered wool required for woolens. Once Arkwright's patents were invalidated, the field was open to other inventors to find a way to adapt the water frame. After a period of inactivity, John Coltman, a hosier from Leicester, I think it's Leicester, is how you say that, a hosier from Leicester, motivated by a desire to overcome the bottleneck in Warstead yarn by the new and expanding Warstead hosiery trade, found a way to adapt the water frame to Warstead spinning. As had taken place in cotton, the shortage of yarn was overcome and now there was a plentiful supply. Both the hosiery and trade hosiery trade and the handloom weaving excuse me, both the hosiery trade and handloom weaving were able to expand, except in Leicester. Footnote 
Coltman's attempt to introduce his adapted frame to the works of master comer Joseph Whetstone met with demonstrations in Leicester. Just so you know, when I'm saying Leicester, it's spelled L-E-I-C-S-T-E-R. So it sounds like it would be Leicester, but I think it is Leicester. I'm not sure. I might be wrong about that. And if I am wrong about that, I don't know where I got that information. <laughs> Quote, the corporation forbade them to operate the machine within 50 miles of the town, end quote. Coltman relocated to Bromsgrove, Worcestershire, to start another partnership that spun high-quality Worstead yarn. Another successful attempt to spin high-quality Worstead was made by the partners Robert Davidson and John Hawksley, who built Arno Mill, or Arnott Mill, A-R-N-O-T Mill, at Arnold, Outside Nottingham, Jenkins and Ponting, 1982, and footnote. Quote, by 1800, there were 18 power-driven Worstead spinning mills, four powered by steam, the rest by water power. Only after 1800, however, did investment in these factories pick up once the quality of yarn improved to the point where these factories could compete with domestic production, end quote. The number of Worstead mills increased from 22 to 54 between 1800 and 1815. As these operations were far from any source of coal and had a plentiful supply of water, the steam engine would only make slow progress in the northwestern Worstead districts of West Riding. The remoteness from the coal fields also delayed the advent of steam in Scotland, and it was, quote, almost unknown in Wales and the broader communities of Northern England, end quote. The west of England was slower to take up the steam-driven factory. Coal here ran at four times the price it did in Yorkshire. Only one Bolton and Watt engine was in use by 1805 in Gloucestershire and Wiltshire, while the scribbling engine was accepted with a minimum of resistance in Gloucestershire. In parts of the west of England, the scribbling engine encountered prolonged resistance. There were violent protests against it in the Wiltshire towns of Trowbridge and Bradford on Avon in 1791 and 1792, and at Shepton Mallet, Somerset in 1794. Footnote. In May 1791, a crowd of some 500 workers stoned the house of a prominent clothier in Bradford-on-Avon. The clothier, Joseph Phelps, fired on the crowd, killing five protesters, including a boy, whereupon, quote, his nerve broken, bracket, he, end bracket, handed over the bracket scribbling engine, end bracket, to be ceremoniously burned on the bridge, end quote. At Trowbridge, a crowd of the same size protested in September, and again in August 1792 when they joined with local miners and attacked both scribbling engines and shuttle looms. Linen, the second class textile. Undoubtedly, quote, the least known of the major English textile industries, end quote, is linen. Hart, 1973. The reason for this is straightforward. English demand for linen was high, and this meant that a high volume of linen imports flowed into England, comprising about 15% of total imports during the first half of the 18th century. Quote, Linen was, in fact, the most important manufactured import into pre-industrial England until the end of the 18th century. Imports of, quote, linens ranked second only to imported, quote, groceries, end quote, in total value, end quote. Hart. Meanwhile, English production before the early 18th century was mostly local and not for export. Thus, we have good records of the volume of linen imports and poor records of English production. 
The reason linen was in such high demand was that it served so many uses, from household wares such as napkins and bedding to industrial uses such as sacks, canvas, and sailcloth. Linen production took place in all four corners of England, in eight counties of the southwest on the Lancashire Plain, in the northwest in Yorkshire, County Durham, and Northumberland in the northeast, and in East Anglia. In Lancashire, in Scotland, linen production served as the basis for the growth of cotton industry, the cotton industry, providing the warp to be combined with cotton weft for the making of fustian. There's fustian. I don't know how you say that. Jean, velvet, velveteen, corduroy, and so on. Prior to the water frame and the making of cotton threads suitable for warp. By 1700, however, English linen was produced mainly for local consumption, quote, and was still, for the most part, bumpkin wear, end quote. Wilson, 1984. The story of the rise and fall of linen in the 18th century hinges on the imposition of duties on imports and later bounties to encourage exports. The goal of the British government was to reduce dependence upon foreign supplies of linen, and this included the encouragement of linen production in Scotland and Ireland to fill the gap. For both Scotland and Ireland, linen was the prime export product and was second only to agriculture in numbers of workers employed. While Parliament had banned Irish woolen exports in 1699, Irish linen had been allowed to enter English markets duty-free since 1696, and shipping to the colonies was allowed after 1705. For Scotland, the Act of Union in 1707 brought an end to the payment of duties on linen exports to England. Scottish linen was of poor quality, and in 1727 an Act was passed, quote, for the better regulation of linen and hempen manufactures in Scotland, end quote. And henceforth linen was, excuse me, and henceforth linen that reached the required standard of quality, length, and breadth was stamped, end quote. From 1743, a bounty was established to stimulate English exports. It was periodically allowed to lapse and then renewed, lasting until 1830. The bounty was also applied to Scottish linens. The impact of such subsidies was profound. It stimulated the rapid growth of linen production in England. Its effect on Scottish linen production can be demonstrated by the fact that when it was withdrawn, depression immediately set in. Set in. By around 1780, English, Scottish, and Irish exports of linen had all risen dramatically, but different regions suffered different fates. In Ireland, the peak years of linen exports were 1780 to 1825. However, the expansion of Irish linen production contributed to rural impoverishment and the development of a disarticulated economy. I missed a footnote earlier. Footnote. Scottish output of coarse Osnaburg linen, an imitation of German Osnabrück linen, soared from, quote, just over 0.5 million yards in 1747 to 1.1 million in 1753 and 2.2 million yards in 1758 and became within a decade a major Scottish product and export commodity, end quote. But, quote, when the bounty was briefly withdrawn in the mid-1750s, production of Osnaburg fell by half, end quote. End footnote. High population growth meant an almost unlimited supply of cheap labor. The availability of marginal lands that could be put under flax also kept prices low. These factors meant that rural, mostly female spinners who increasingly depended upon flax spinning for their subsistence were stuck at a level of producing for bare subsistence even as the linen industry in Ireland expanded rapidly. In East Anglia, the last decades of the 18th century brought about a dramatic reversal of fortunes. The once wealthy region became one of the poorest regions in England as a result of rising population and the decline of rural manufactures, 
exacerbated by wartime inflation. As rural poverty set in, the poor rates in East Anglia soared. The decline of linen manufacture here was part of an overall decline in rural manufactures in the face of these pressures and competition from the emerging factories in the north. In Lancashire, the cotton industry developed in large part as an outgrowth of the linen industry. Quote, the linen manufacture in Lancashire hath declined within these last few years, end quote, a leading London draper stated in 1786, quote, from the great increase of the cotton manufacture in that, in, in that country, end quote. Linen itself did undergo mechanization, however. Edmund Cartwright attempted to apply the power loom to weaving coarse linens in 1787. Flax spinning was first achieved by John Kendrew and John Porthouse in 1787. A year later, John Marshall of Leeds established the first of his two mills in the vicinity of Leeds for spinning flax. His became a major concern involving intense factory discipline, and Leeds became the new center of linen production in England. Quote, by 1790, the English linen industry was following its offspring cotton into a period in which the main factor in its development was to be technological change rather than protection, end quote. Hark. Other flax and linen mills followed Marshall's example, but the progress was not comparable to that of, quote, King Cotton, end quote. As in Lancashire, the linen, the linen industry in Scotland provided the basis for the growth of the cotton industry. In the 1770s, linen manufacture was still the foremost industry in Scotland, but by the 1790s, it had been overtaken. Footnote. This did not mean that linen production in Scotland declined. It continued to expand, but suffered serious setbacks followed by recoveries early on in the 19th century. Iron and Steam We have already seen how within the mining and metalworking trades there existed a tension between, on the one hand, the high degree of proletarianization of labor and the assertion of absolute property rights in land in the form of mines, and on the other hand, the continued use of such practices as subcontracting within mines and the putting out of materials to domestic workshops, leaving the control of the production process in the hands of the workmen, thereby preserving certain customary forms of labor organization. While skilled laborers in the textile trade, such as engineers, continued to assert a high degree of control over the labor process well into the 19th century, where unskilled labor was concerned, the development of the factory system drew a fairly sharp contrast between a customary or traditional mode of production in which the knowledge and control of the production process still belonged to the worker and a capitalist mode of production in which they belonged to the owner of the means of production. With exceptions, there was no corresponding development within the mining and metalworking trades. There is, this is largely due to the fact that, as a previous and as previously discussed, while the size of forges, furnaces, hammers, and vats increased, the work remained predominantly manual in nature. This is particularly true in mining, where the coal seam or rock continued to be worked with pickaxe and shovel. The key innovations here were process innovations, not product innovations. A deeper inquiry into the stages of capitalist development in this sphere would require detailed analysis of both larger and smaller firms, the various forms of labor practices that were applied, and a study of how these evolved over time, as Ashton comments, quote, these issues are understudied, end quote. Ashton. Coal and iron were two metal chemical industries that were closely interlinked by necessity, and the great metalworking industries grew up in districts where coal was abundant. The principal region of coal mining in England, as we know, was in the northeast around Newcastle, where the Grand Lessees, Grand Alleys, and the Crowleys had enjoyed dominance. South Wales had, was also of great importance as a source of coal, and iron working, iron working rose and fell beside it. 
A third region was the Scottish Lowlands, and great metalworking industries grew up in and around Birmingham in the West Midlands. Iron production plays a peculiar role in the story of the Industrial Revolution. Without the expansion of iron production, the gears, wheels, levers, coils, shafts, pistons, and rails that made up the machinery of the Industrial Revolution could not have been built. Yet iron production itself was not initially affected by the rapid development of new machinery that we commonly identify with the Industrial Revolution. In the 18th century, the West Midlands became the heart of Britain's iron industry. Through this region flowed the River Severn and its tributaries, providing both water power and transport. Here, iron ore, coal, and wood were abundant. Wherever iron, coal, and streams could be found together, new metalworking industries were bound to appear, and along the Severn, scattered ironworks were, quote, constantly exchanging iron at different stages of production, end quote, along, quote, one of the busiest commercial waterways in Europe, end quote. Footnote, quote, various subsidiary, subsidiary industries, earthenware, potteries, glass houses, tobacco pipe manufactories, tar distilleries, and salt works had grown up in the area, end quote. Open fields persisted here, subject to piecemeal enclosure, and in some areas a division of labor arose between those who intensified their crop rotations or specialized in raising carriage horses and those who specialized in metal working and began to keep fewer animals. In both agriculture and manufacturing, economic exchanges had long been based on cash. As we have seen, it was here in the West Midlands that the elder Darby made his discovery that would ultimately revolutionize British iron production. Abraham Darby II took over his father's works in 1730 and continued to perfect the method. Darby II introduced vertical integration into the work, signing the rights to lease coal mines in the surrounding region and opening several new blast furnaces. Footnote. Darby not only improved methods of smelting with coke, he made stronger water-powered bellows and pioneered the use of regions such as ore limestone. Next footnote. Quote, in all nine blast furnaces were... Excuse me. In all nine blast furnaces were built within four miles of Colebrook Dale in the four years between 1755 and 1758. End footnote. Additionally, only the Darbys specialized in making cast iron products on such a scale that they could make coking pay. Footnote. Dean found it odd that Darby would have brought his workmen with him from Bristol at a time when employers were seeking ways to circumvent the irritating craft restrictions that still held sway in older towns. But part of this story is that one of his workmen and fellow Quaker, John Thomas, had succeeded in casting bellied iron pots for which Darby took out a patent in 1707. Quote, Thomas signed an agreement that he would only work for Darby in the casting of pots and that he would not teach his secrets to anyone else for a period of three years, end quote. The Darbys also kept secret another patent of Abraham Darby, who had discovered in, 19, excuse me, who had discovered in 1707 a superior way of making thin-walled castings poured straight from the foundry furnace for which pig iron was more applicable than wrought iron. End footnote. The Darby's Colebrookdale works grew from a single blast furnace started in 1702 to what one observer in 1768 described as, quote, that variety of horrors art has spread at the bottom. End quote. Of the otherwise romantic and beautiful valley that is Colebrookdale. Quote, the noise of the forges, mills, etc., with all their vast machinery, the flames bursting from the furnaces with the burning of the coal, and the smoke of the lime kilns are altogether sublime. End quote. 
Young, 1785, as cited in Hammond and Hammond, 1974. Iron Bridge Gorge Museums and Bliss Hill Open Air Museum, visit by author November 1997. End footnote. The spread of coke-fired blast furnaces in the West Midlands would revolutionize not only the local economy, quote, but also its settlement pattern and landscape, end quote. By the 1760s, quote, there was already a large skilled workforce dependent on industry for a living and a wide diffusion of manufacture, marketing, and management, end quote. Large landowners, quote, became much more active in developing the mineral assets of their estates, end quote, though large landowners generally, quote, took no direct part in manufacturing industry, end quote, but rather focused their efforts on facilitating their access to minerals by enclosing and on canal building for the transportation of their minerals to more distant markets. John Wilkinson's father, Isaac, had been among those who set up a coke furnace modeled after the Darby's. His success was not that of an inventor, but of the next generation of, quote, quick, uh, excuse me, next generation of, quote, men quick to note new inventions, to realize their practical value and to use them for their own profit, end quote. He had his own warehouse in London, his own coal fields, foundries in South Wales and Indret, France, near Nantes, or Nantes. The interest in Cornish, the interest in Cornish, excuse me, and or interest in Cornish tin mining, Wilkinson followed in the footsteps of the Crowleys and Darbys in pioneering vertical integration. He developed what Manto describes as a kind of quote industrial state, which he governed with a strong and autocratic hand. This state, more important and much richer than many Italian or German principalities, enjoyed a credit which they might well envy, end quote. Manto. Footnote. Quote. His major ironworks were centered in four main areas around Rexham, Bersham, and Brimbo, near Brosley, Old Willie, this is Old Willie and New Willie, near Birmingham and Wolverhampton, Bradley and Bilston, and near Wellington, Hadley, end quote. His works made the first iron chairs, iron and lead pipes, and huge vats for the expanding breweries, and we have already mentioned his involvement in making iron bridges and barges. Wilkinson relied heavily upon subcontracting to, quote, charter masters, end quote, or, quote, buddies, end quote, who worked on monthly contracts and hired their own holers and pikemen, skilled laborers paid by the day, and hired their own and, and bandsmen, casual workmen who were paid twice per week. Payment in credit notes, redeemable only in a Tommy shop, was common, and the truck system was apparently so advanced under Wilkinson that, like a German prince, he coined his own money with his own image upon it. Workers were generally provided with on-site housing, coal to heat their homes, and when the work was particularly strenuous, free ale at the brew house. Apprenticeships were served, and according to Solden, quote, the structure of the industry involving as it did apprenticeships resembled something of the form of or spirit of the old guilds of ironmongers and founders, end quote. But according to Pollard, under the buddy system, the B-U-T-T -T system, not the buddy system like he did at the, <laughs> the water park, the quote, Buddy was a capitalist employer whose profits depended on reducing the men's wages below the bargain price he made with the coal owner, end quote. Here again, we must ask to what extent such ostensibly capitalist practices were balanced by the continuity of custom. 
In the Scottish Lowlands, John Roebuck borrowed 12,000 pounds to set up the first major Scottish ironworks along the Carron River in 1760, where Darby's methods were introduced with dramatic success. English workmen from the West Midlands country excuse me, the West Midlands counties were brought north at considerable expense to take the skilled positions. Footnote. Roebuck may be better remembered for underwriting this research of a still unknown engineer and inventor by the name of James Watt during the period of his experiments leading to a patent. End footnote. The firm was initially poorly managed. Roebuck, the principal, went bankrupt in 1773, having overextended himself in coal, salt, and chemical operations. New management under Charles Gascoigne brought, quote, draconian rule, end quote, and a restoration of profitability, the profits accruing mainly to Gascoigne. Gascoigne. G-A-S-C-O-I-G-N-E. The Karen Company expanded rapidly in response to government contracts for the American War. In 1750, the economic position of Wales in relation to England was similar to that of the colonies, being a supplier of raw wool, unfattened cattle, and coal. Between 1700 and 1750, Wales produced just less than 3% of Great Britain's coal output. Between 1750 and 1800, however, this figure leapt to over 11%. During the same period, North Wales saw the growth of copper mining, which failed soon thereafter, and over a long period, iron, iron mining and iron making in South Wales saw a tremendous expansion, followed much later by contraction. Ultimately, coal would endure as the primary industry of South Wales. Initially, poor roads hindered the development of what was otherwise an obvious site for setting up ironworks. But in 1765, an iron ore merchant named Anthony Bacon and his partner William Brownrigg obtained a 99-year lease granting a concession on all mines within 40 miles of Merthyr Tidefill, paying an annual rent of just £100. In 1771, the road of Martha Tidefill was turnpike, providing better access to Bacon's four ironworks, Caifartha, Dowlace, Penny Derham, and Plymouth Works. Richard Crawshay, the son of a Yorkshire farmer, could be said to have had incredible good fortune. He received a large dowry upon his marriage to Mary Bourne in 1763 and bought out Brownrigg's share in the works for £1,500 in 1777. Then, in 1779-80, to 80, he won a state lottery and bought his way into Bacon's partnership. By his retirement in 1782, Bacon had grown rich from supplying government orders for artillery to be used in the American War. The inventor, Henry Court, also set up ironworks in the hopes of supplying the admira Admiralty. As a former agent of the Royal Navy, Court had grown concerned about the deficit in the quality of English iron against that of Sweden or Russia. Leaving his post in 1775, Court set up an ironworks on, at Fontley, Hampshire, and in 1783 received his first patent on the puddling process. Footnote, patent number 1420, 13th of February, 1784. We have already reviewed the steps leading to the development of potting, puddling, and rolling. Leaving his post in 17... Excuse me. Following the all-too-familiar pattern of other inventors, Court was unable to bring his invention to commercial success, being ruined by the calling in of his debt upon the death of his financier. But Richard Crawshay and Samuel Homfray, who had taken over Bacon's Penny Darren works, quote, were the first ironmasters to use the puddling process, and they grew rich while court was ruined, end quote. <laughs>
In 1787, the Karfarfa works was only producing 10 tons of bar iron per week. Soon after, a meeting with Richard Court led Crawshay to adopt the puddling and rolling method, and output leapt to 200 tons per week. The puddling process removed the barriers to integration in the iron industry, allowing for forges and furnaces to be integrated into a single works and facilitating a rapid growth in output and the building of new iron works. Court's primary goal, improving the quality of English iron, was also achieved. Quote, iron produced by Court's process took the place of wood in shafts, gears, wheels, and machines, and this also powerfully aided the growth of scale of the factory or works, end quote. In 1794, Crochet brought the entire right, excuse me, bought the entire rights to the Car Farthfa Ironworks. Like Wilkinson, Crochet quote founded a dynasty of iron masters end quote, earning him the moniker quote the Iron King end quote. With the advent of puddling and rolling, a new division of labor appeared at the foundries and forges. Charcoal burners, keepers, bridge servers, and fillers tended the furnace, typically numbering seven men in all, with women and children employed to sort and prepare the ore. Making bar iron at the forges required skilled finers and master hammermen who served in the role of foreman and was among the, quote, aristocracy of labor, end quote. To become a, quote, master of the bloom, end quote, required a three to seven years apprenticeship. Therefore, as we ought to expect, where we find skilled labor, we again find the customary mode of labor organization, masters and apprentices, no doubt with the accompanying notion of this being a, quote, honorable trade, end quote. Since making pig iron at the foundries involved mostly unskilled labor, the condition of the workers was probably proletarian in character. Footnote. A third site of production, aside from foundries and forges, was a slitting mill, where bar iron was cut up for the making of nails. Quote, the slitting wheel, which was worked by water, broke or cut up the cold bar into short lengths. These lengths were then heated, and when heat put under the rollers, excuse me, and when hot put under the rollers, also worked by water and roller flat. Finally, they were put through cutters of different sizes when it leapt the slitting and rolling mills, the iron was ready for the smith. In the slitting and rolling mills, a different set of workers, bracket, then at the forge, and bracket, were employed, but not much is known of their circumstances, end quote. Hammond and Hammond, 1974. But given the high, higher degree of necessary skill and the risk involved, metal workers tended to make wages considerably higher than farm workers or miners. As with the potteries in Staffordshire, the small metals and, quote, toys, end quote, trades in Birmingham were seeing the development of an increasingly detailed division of labor, quote, each branch was carried on by a small master with possibly half a dozen workmen on piecework and without the aid of any except, uh, uh, without the aid of any except muscular power. The work was done to the order of the merchants who secured and distributed the orders bracket and end bracket organized the selling and export of the products, end quote. For well over a century, Birmingham had been a center for making hardware and quote toys, end quote, including quote buttons, buckles, watch change, chatelaines, snuff boxes, corkscrews, sugar nippers, end quote, and sword hilts. Birmingham offered several attractions to manufacturers. There were plenty of forests nearby. Like Manchester, it was an unincorporated and therefore unregulated town. And after the Restoration, Birmingham, which had solidly packed Parliament in the Civil War, attracted many dissenters who brought with them new energies, talents, and technical knowledge. By the latter half of the 18th century, a number of Birmingham industrialists, including Henry Clay... John Taylor, Sampson Lloyd, Samuel Garbett, John Gimblet, Matthew Bolton employed large numbers of workers. 
Clay reported they employed 300 workers. Taylor's workforce apparently rose from 500 in 1755 to between 600 and 700 in 1762. It is likely that these numbers include a large portion of outworkers. It appears that Taylor's work, while never making the full transition from workshop to factory, took the division of labor within the workshop to its logical extreme. Button making, for example, involves 70 separate processes. Quote, Lady Shelburne called him the, quote, principal and, quote, manufacturer in Birmingham in 1766. When he died in 1775, his estate was valued at, was valued at 200,000 pounds, end quote. Goodison, 1971. When Samuel Bolton died in 1759, he had left to his son Matthew a small workshop at Snow Hill that had been engaged in making buttons and small metal wares. Three years earlier, Matthew Bolton married his distant cousin Mary Robinson, an heiress to a large fortune. Both Mary Robinson's father and John Taylor bore the title of, quote, Esquire, end quote. Quote, the word, quote, Esquire, end quote, in the middle of the 18th century still had some significance. It was only given to men who were members of the lesser gentry or who came of well-established middle-class families, end quote. Mantu. Mantu. Oh, fuck you, man. Having married into the gentry, Bolton, quote, could easily have settled down as a country gentleman, <coughs> end quote, quote, writes Mantu, but, quote, he loved industry, end quote. One assumes the same holds for John Taylor. The question is, what was the attraction? One suggestion is that they found the increasingly competitive nature of the Birmingham and small metalwares trades alluring particularly when both men enjoyed a distinctive advantage in the form of private wealth drawn from estates. We can only imagine how smaller masters in Birmingham viewed Bolton's arrogance when he declared that it was his task to, quote, clean, excuse me, his task to cleanse, quote, Birmingham's bad reputation, end quote, by insisting upon only, quote, the best materials and the most skilled workmen, end quote. Bolton conceived of using his wife's wealth to build a large manufactory in which he could bring all the operations of the trade together under one roof and supervise the works, thereby ensuring a high standard of quality, reducing his overheads, conducting his own warehousing and merchandising, and enjoying the profits of both merchant and manufacturer. He located a suitable plot of land at Handsworth Heath along the road to Wolverhampton, where he tore down a water-powered metal rolling mill and at a cost of £10,000, erected the Soho Manufactory between 1759 and 1766. The work was subdivided into separate rooms with foremen or subcontractors supervising a workforce comprising mostly women and children working, quote, primitive, end quote, and largely hand-driven machinery supplemented by power transmitted by belts and pulleys from a water wheel including lathes, stamps, presses, dyes, or polishers, replacing, quote, simplified tasks, end quote. At the scale of the operation and the range of items, excuse me, as the scale of the operation and the range of items increased, the workforce approached 1,000 by 1770. The division of labor was extended and cooperation between departments allowed for innovation and the creation of novel items of manufacture. Bolton's works is called a manufactory and not a factory because, unlike a factory, it was not engaged in mass-producing standard products, but rather in individually crafting pieces of high-quality artisanship in the same manner as his close colleague Josiah Wedgwood produced pottery. In many ways, Bolton's career parallels that of Wedgwood. Out of the small metals trade, Bolton and his partner, John Fothergill, ventured into the high-end market of metal wares, such as gold-plated bronze, also known as, quote, Ormolu, end quote. They soon earned a, quote, name for quality, which was second to none, end quote, and were thus, and were thus quote, widely patronized by the aristocracies of both England and Europe, end quote. 
Just as Wedgwood needed to sell his, quote, useful ware, end quote, Bolton and Fothergill relied on the small metal wares trade to sustain the scale of the operation, their highly sought ormolu and their other ornaments being insufficient for this purpose. Fothergill's role as merchant was to keep the works informed of changing taste and styles in foreign and domestic markets. Like Wedgwood, Bolton hired skilled artists and decorators that were behind excuse me that were beyond the reach of most of his competitors competition for skilled craftsmen amongst the large employers was intense especially between taylor and bolton poaching was not uncommon footnote quote set as he was against the use of london goldsmiths and quote bolton quote nevertheless had to lure silversmiths chasers braziers coppersmiths all manner of craftsmen away from their original master, end quote. In the midst of, oh, end footnote, in the midst of a trade that would continue to be dominated by workshops for another century and more, the Soho manufactory was an oddity. Bolton's pioneering efforts in vertical integration and organizational innovation were undoubtedly informed by the methods of Crowley and Wedgwood. In its early days, quote, Soho alone, quote, combined in a factory all classes of workmen engaged in the manufacture of its various products, and in the owner of this factory was vested the technical as well as the economic, entire economic control over his employees, end quote, end quote. Yet this control had limits, and the almost direct transference of independent workmen into such a factory-style setting is surely the cause for some of the management problems which were faced. Quote, never had the two systems of, quote, manufacture, end quote, and factories so nearly approximated, end quote, wrote Mantu. Quote, and never had the distinction between the two been harder to make without becoming involved in subtleties and arbitrary distinctions, end quote. The manufactory, factory, excuse me, the manufactory employed over 600 workers by 1762 and possibly 1,000 by 1772, and a turnover that rose, excuse me, with a turn, turnover that rose from seven thousand pounds in 1763 to thirty thousand pounds by 1767. In a works of this scale, subcontracting and contractors profiteering by squeezing wages was likely to be common. Bolton rejected piecework, however, paying his unskilled workers between two and twenty shillings per week, and his department heads the unheard of sum of nine pounds per week. An insurance society was established for the workers offering sickness and funeral benefits. Rule 3 of the rule book reads, quote, Each member shall pay to the treasure box agreeable to the table following, which is divided into eight parts, viz. the member who is set down at two shillings and sixpence per week, shall pay one half penny per week, five shillings, one penny, etc. One penny, end quote, etc. as quoted in Delive, 1971. Here we see that the safe box of the Friendly Society was also directly adapted. Like Arkwright and Strutt, Bolton hosted communal events for his workers, such as a ball attended by 700 people upon his son's coming of age. Footnote. Quote, communal feasts as part of the old pattern of leisure activities were to be throttled together with other relics of an older morality. End quote. Pillard. 1965. Loam, Wedgwood, Arkwright, and Bolton all struggled with and to some extent accommodated lingering expectations of custom and paternal benevolence. End footnote. With benefits and high wages, Bolton was able to fulfill his quest of Attracting the best talent, and with its high standards of quality and workmanship, Soho became a kind of private academy for skilled engineers and craftsmen. Footnote. Among the skilled craftsmen whom Bolton attracted to work at Soho was John Wyatt, the same who had partnered with Lewis Paul in patenting the first cotton spinning machine. At Soho, Wyatt and his son Charles introduced the word screw, quote, a double-acting lathe with lever motion and tools for cutting pearl buttons and button molds, end quote. The son of John Gimblet, 
One of Bolton's competitors who had sought to undercut Bolton's prices later found himself working at Soho as an associate partner. End footnote. But relatively high wages also cut into profits and invited abuse. Like Wedgwood, when Bolton was away on business, this invited indiscipline, misunderstandings, and delays. Footnote. James Keir, Lunar Society med member of Edinburgh, was tasked in 1778 to manage the manufactory in decline, but he did send, quote, two critical letters which revealed some of the malpractices of the workmen and the mismanagement which took place when Bolton was away on his travels. Much silver is at the mercy of the workmen, end quote. Fothergill was a poor manager, and when John Scale was hired to oversee in Bolton's absence, he found himself overwhelmed. This led to the consideration of paying in piecework common among other manufacturers. End footnote. Bolton demonstrated an idealism that, unlike most manufacturers of his time, could only have come from someone whose personal financial security was guaranteed. Footnote. Bolton was beset with a constant shortage of capital, and this may have had something to do with his policy of allowing his customers six months to pay whilst paying his own suppliers inside of six weeks. End footnote. Bolton's fame and fortune as an industrious were assured, however, by his partnership with James Watt. Born in Greencock, Scotland, Watt attended the University of Glasgow, where he became interested in steam engines. In 1765, he conceived of the separate condenser engine, and it was on his way to the patent office in 1768 that he met Matthew Bolton. The meeting was followed up by a letter from Bolton in which he wrote, quote, I was excited by two motives to offer you your assistance, which were the love of you and the love of a money-getting ingenious project. Engine would require money, very accurate workmanship, end quote. Footnote. Letter from Bolton to Watt, 7th of February, 1769, from display at Soho House, Birmingham, visit by author, the 29th of October, 1997. End footnote. Since Watt's backer, John Roebuck, was in financial straits, Bolton was able to acquire Roebuck's share in Watt's project in return for the cancellation of a debt Roebuck owed to Bolton. A patent was granted in 1769 and extended in 1775. After initial difficulties in perfecting a marketable product, the first engine began operating at a colliery in Tipton, a few miles from Soho. In 1776, John Wilkinson ordered the second engine to power a bellows for one of his furnaces at his Wiley Ironworks. Two engines were installed at the Darby's Kettley Works in 1778 and 1780. In 1781, the old Newcomer engine in Colebrookdale was replaced and the new Bolton and Watt engine was named, quote, Resolution, end quote. Richard Arkwright was the first cotton spinner to inquire about the expense of a steam engine visiting Soho in 1777, but the first factory master to purchase one was Peter Drinkwater of Manchester in 1789. Arkwright bought his a year later from his Nottingham Mill. Under their patent, Bolton and Watt required payment of a third of the savings in fuel that the installation of a separate condenser engine produced. This demonstrates how conscious they were of the incentive for large manufacturers to reduce costs of production. Marx credited Watt's genius in recognizing that his invention, unlike most others, was built not for a specific purpose, but had universal applicability. The story of the spread of steam power is well known. Bolton's interest in buckles, buttons, Ormolu and Ormolu soon flagged in the face of the profit potential of steam. Part of his manufactory, parts of his manufactory were converted to the making of components for, quote, Bolton and Watt, end quote, engines. Quote, as the end of the patent period approached, however, the firm decided to become a large-scale producer of complete steam engines and erected in 1795 the, quote, Soho factory, excuse me, the, quote, Soho foundry, end quote, for this purpose.
Among its outstanding innovations were careful and most elaborate costing, planning of the flow of production and of products, standardization of components and processes, and subdivision of labor among the many skills, some of which the firm itself had introduced and developed, end quote. It was here that, quote, the technical as well as the entire economic control of the owner over his employees, end quote, was achieved. For at the foundry, there were no centuries-old craft traditions to negotiate with. Like Wedgwood, Bolton could recruit, quote, plain country lads, waifs, and orphans, and train them up from scratch. Thus, a more perfect commodification of labor could be achieved at the foundry. At the same time, however, by training skilled engineers, Bolton and Watt contributed to the emergence of a new stratum of skilled craftsmen. Mining. The 18th century saw the growth of mining and metallurgical operations of considerable scale in Britain and Ireland. A quote, promotion mania, end quote, in the 1690s had brought forth a number of large concerns, some of which succeeded, some of which failed almost immediately. The mine adventurers of England, having taken control of some silver mines and smelting works in Cardiganshire in 1698, was a fraud that offered lottery tickets for shares. The English Copper Company was founded in 1691 and amalgamated with other concerns in 1720. A successful operation, it survived into the 19th century. Notable copper mines were located in Cornwall, Cumberland, and Anglesey, where a de deposit of rich copper ore was discovered at Perry's Mountain in 1768 and at Ecton Hill in Staffordshire, which by 1790 was the largest source of copper in Britain but soon ran dry. Copper smelting and brass works gave rise to large operations such as the Warmley Company of Gloucestershire, employing 2,000 workers in 1746, quote, it was in the copper smelting industry and the related brass works that some of the largest firms and some of the most interesting managerial experiences were developed. End quote. By 1746, the Warmley Company of William Champion, Thomas Goldney, and Sampson Lloyd employed 2,000 workers at Bristol in brass works. By 1765, it was bankrupt, and in 1767, with a capital of £200,000, it was sold to the British Brass Company. The, quote, Copper King, end quote, Thomas Williams, a lawyer who leveraged his way into the position of being a managing partner at the Perry's Mine Company, went on to acquire copper works in Cornwall and Lancashire, and enjoyed a partnership with John Wilkinson. Brass had been introduced in Britain around the time of the Restoration and, quote, greatly extended the scope of the Birmingham metalworking trades, end quote. It was another home industry that enjoyed protection. Bristol and Swansea were centers for copper and zinc working and brass works, but the late 18th century saw several large operations rise up in Birmingham. The Birmingham Brass Company in 1780, the Birmingham Mining and Manufacturing Company in 1790, and the Rose Copper Company in 1793. In, leading in lead mining, the London Quaker Lead Company amalgamated in 1704 from three companies that had appeared in the promotion mania of the 1690s, quote, the company was mining and smelting lead over its long history in Wales, Derbyshire, Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man, the north of England, and survived until 1905, end quote. Despite a slowdown in activity after the death of retirement, excuse me, the death or retirement of the first generation of owners around 1730, the company revived after 1792, thanks in part at least to, quote, its carefully thought-out training and promotion program, and its social welfare schemes for workers coupled with an unusually tight discipline over them, end quote. Lead mining in Derbyshire around Worksworth dates to the Roman era. In the 18th century, most mines in Derbyshire were small, but in the third quarter of the century, the largest, the Gregory Mine, 
averaged 1,500 tons per annum. By the fourth quarter, lead mining here was in full decline just as the textile factories were arriving. Tin mining in Cornwall was a, has a long history, and large works appeared early. In the tin and copper mines, many works adopted the, quote, cost book system, under which the partners met quarterly to divide up the profits, leaving little capital for reinvestment. Depression in the trade and drainage problems at the turn of the 17th century had called out for a solution as, quote, one pit after another was being drowned out and the future of the industry seemed very precarious, end quote. Pollard. John Costar, quote, successfully used a, long, a single large water wheel to drain some of the deeper mines in 1710. William Lemon achieved his success at Wheel Fortune Mine after applying a new Komen engine to the works in 1720. At least 200, excuse me, at least two other minerals in England were mined on a scale involving considerable numbers of workers. Slate quarries were worked in Wales and Cum Cumbria with works up to a thousand men seen as early as 1782. Salt had been mined in Cheshire in Roman times and was rediscovered in 1657. By 1675, 26,927 tons of salt were manufactured in Cheshire annually. A second center of salt manufacture was in Durham at Shields. Salt works employed far fewer men than in other mining operations. In Scotland, sea salt was collected along the northeast and northwest coasts. From 1765 on, writes Pollard, quote, the northern coal mines could be said to have become large industrial units of recognizably modern type, end quote, Pollard. After some two decades of virtually unregulated coal trading, the cartel, sometimes known as the limitation of the vend, sought to control coal prices by limiting the output of its members. This practice would continue on and off until 1845. These large, larger owners, who sought to control the trade by purchasing most of the mines less than 60 fathoms deep, Beginning in 1778, interlopers were sinking shafts of 100 fathoms and more, weakening the control of the, quote, Grand Alliance. And by the 1820s and 1830s, the trade was, quote, profitable, progressive, and booming, end quote. Pollard. The Alliance probably never controlled more than 60% of the mines, and the control of the larger owners progressively weakened over time. Alongside the continuation of this ongoing attempt at monopoly was the continuation of the venerable practice of requiring colliers to agree to annual, quote, bindings, annually negotiated contracts under which the collier and his family were obliged, ob obligated to work the mines for the duration of the bond in return for housing, steady, steady employment, and the guarantee that sons would be brought up in the trade. This security of employment encouraged high birth rates and a steady supply of labor for the owners. It was also the basis for a unique culture that was hostile to outsiders and laid a strong foundation for trade union activity in the 19th century. The coal owners in Cumberland enjoyed a, quote, monopolistically controlled market in Ireland, end quote. And the mines were quite advanced by the early 18th century, turning out 38,000 tons by 1709. Footnote. Cumbria was a poor agricultural region with similarities to South Wales. It had been a mining region since at least the 16th century. Iron, copper, lead, slate, and slate were all mined here. As the manorial courts declined in the 18th century, a variety of manufacturing and other buy employments arose, including dairying, gunpowder manufacture, paper making, and from the 18th century, bobbin manufacturing. Despite considerable growth of iron mining and smelting in Cumbria through the 18th century, along with the growth of these other lines of manufacturing and an emerging middle class, <clears throat> 
the iron industry was ultimately destined to contract along with the rest of the economy as external competition undercut the region's economy. End footnote. Where am I? By 1813, there were 20 miles of underground railroads, 600 employees, and 1,000 horses at work. Subcontracting was most prevalent in the Midlands and South Wales in the form of the, quote, buddy system, B-U-T-T, -T, which came in the form of the, quote, little buddy, end quote, in which the co subcontractor worked alongside his employees and the big buddy in which he merely negotiated prices, provided tools and equipment, and pocketed about a quarter of their earnings. The most extraordinary growth in coal mining was in South Wales, <laughs> which contributed little to British output in 1760, but represented 42% of British output by 1830. In that year, 15 firms exceeded 10,000 tons in annual output, and 12 of these were in South Wales. In Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, and Staffordshire, the coal mines were small by comparison. In the forest of Dean, Gloucestershire, miners enjoyed common rights to cut wood and graze their beast at least until 1777 when the mine law court was abolished, sparking six day decades of strife during which miners fought to defend their customary rights. Here, then, we find another direct parallel between agrarian enclosures and what we have suggested could be called, quote, quote, coal enclosures, end quote. The West Lancashire collieries were worked by few hands, being subject to extreme fluctuations in output and in wages. Colliers worked in family groups, and the high percentage of women and girls employed astonished observers. After 1730, growth grew rapidly, as did population growth among colliers. The Worsley Colliery had 331 colliers working underground in 1783, and it was, of course, here that miles of underground canals were dug. The structure of mining resembled the domestic system in textiles and probably discouraged innovation. The most striking continuation of what was not only a customary but an effective feudal mode of labor organization was in the coal mines of Scotland. Here colliery serfdom was the rule. The collier and his family were bound to the mine owned by the lord. Quote, whole families were valued along with horses and equipment in inventories and deeds of sale, end quote. Prevalent in Lothian and Fife, Colliery serfdom lasted until 1799, being phased out by successive pieces of legislation. In general, the insularity of coal mining, with kinship systems controlling recruitment and its high rates of endogamy, gave rise to distinctive cultures that varied extremely from one region to another. As a production process with limited options for close supervision and no prospects of replacing manual labor with large-scale mechanization, the direct control of the labor process with limited options for close supervision and no prospects of replacing manual labor with large-scale mechanization, the direct control of the labor process remained in the hands of the colliers. Owners thus employed ongoing, quote, extra economic, end quote, measures meant to guarantee labor supplies whilst also engaging in contracting, subcontracting, and negotiation, which anticipated fully, fully free labor markets. Under the practice of binding in the Northeast, for example, there were two weeks out of the year where such contracts were renegotiated and rates of relocation in and out of mines by workers was high. Overall, this meant relatively high wages for colliers led by skilled laborers who directly worked the seams, such as the, quote, pikemen in the West Midlands. Their sons and grandsons would lead the great strikes to come a half century later. Beer, paper, and chemicals. <laughs>
The iron brewing industry saw parallel developments, the most obvious of which was that the increase in the size of the productive equipment facilitated the expansion of the firm and gave the owner advantage over his rivals. Both, therefore, involved an extraordinary degree of capitalization, for both there were chemical processes involved which were subject to experimentation and improvement. The biggest difference was that one trade was urban and the other rural-based. Where the brewer could situate his operation right in the midst of his market, the ironmonger profited by placing his furnace and forge in close proximity to a supply of coal, iron, and water power, having to endure transport costs as a penalty. As the brewing industry underwent a complete revolution over the course of the 18th century, it stands out as an exceptional case. Since Tudor times, there had been common brewers in the city, some of them larger breweries located nearby the tower, which provided victualing for ships, V-I-C-T-U-A-L-I-N-G, for ships in addition to exporting their brew. After 1672, the common brewers had an incentive towards centralization in the form of an allowance of three duty-free barrels out of every 36 for, quote, wastage. The larger breweries were under the constant supervision of excise officers checking for fraud. Footnote, quote, excise officers were evidently supervising the biggest breweries continually on a six-hour shift as early as 1724, end quote. Matthias, 1979, and footnote. Similar supervision over the tens of thousands of small victuallers scattered throughout the country would have been impossible. In the larger cities, meanwhile, victuallers were gradually reducing to serve as publicans, quote, pubs, while larger breweries focused on production, leaving sales up to the merchants, thus increasingly the interest of brewers became aligned with the banking and mercantile interests of the city, and the great brewing families began to marry into families represented in the commons. Throughout the 18th century, no less than six members of parliament were brewers, and Southwark and even London became known as, quote, brewers' boroughs, end quote. Footnote. In no industry, writes Matthias, was the, quote, familial structure more marked or tenacious than in brewing, end quote. As an industry, end footnote, as an industry, brewing had a unique advantage. Demand for its production was virtually universal. To the extent that brewing settled in any, quote, region, it centered on London as the largest urban market and was thus perfectly suited to an intensive expansion in the scale of production. The increasing concentration of operations also meant the decline in the number of common brewers in London. As concentration ensued, brewing was subject to innovation in several ways. First, brewing became more scientific. There were no highly revolutionary inventions, but there was considerable progress in adopting, adapting scientific instruments to the measurement and control of the brewing process. The discovery of Porter revolutionized the industry by allowing the brewers themselves to mature it in a in vat and cask, thereby affording them control of both production and distribution. By cutting out the middleman, Porter further aided the concentration of the industry. Footnote. Michael Combrun first applied the thermometer. James Baverstock and John Richardson introduced the hydrometer to measure the relative density, specific gravity of the brew. In 1722, a, quote, obscure London brewer, Ralph Harwood, is said to have first brewed porter, end quote. A heavy, darker, slightly bitter beer. For his part, Harwood made no great fortune, but his innovation would add to the growing fortunes of the large brewers. End footnote. Secondly, as in smelting, the means by which the technology could be improved to expand the scale of production was simple. The size of the vat and the utensils could be increased. By itself, this change, quote, gave economies of scale in costs of construction and materials, end quote. Matthias. This also economized labor further in an industry which was already among the least labor-intensive. Footnote. 
The actual brewing process prior to racking, storing, and distributing barrels required relatively few laborers. Quote, only one man was needed in the valve cock to transfer the contents of the largest vat to the utensil below, end quote. As the scale of production increased, the structure of the labor process changed little, and therefore the share of labor cost out of overall operational cost shrank as a result. Brewers in England and Wales, and this is a chart, Table 9.1. I'm not going to read this chart. Fuck that. I'm too cool for charts. Third, by the 1790s, breweries and their vats were reaching massive proportions. The total outlay on raw materials for a single brewing house might be 100,000 pounds per annum. As soon as the steam engine was available to them, the large brewers took advantage of it. By 1805, virtually the entire process up to the point of racking the barrels had been mechanized. By 1830, quote, the London brewing industry resembled precociously the business situation of later times with integration, imperfect competition, and pricing agreements, end quote. Footnote. In 1830, Charles Barclay of Barclay Perkins Brewery told a committee of Parliament that 1.2 million out of the 1.4 million barrels of beer produced by tax-paying houses in London were produced by the 12 largest breweries. Quote, we are the power loom brewers, if I may so speak, end quote, with, was his remark. End footnote. The Statute of Apprentices does not mention the paper trade because in 1563 it scarcely existed. But as the trade developed, combinations of workers formed long familiar lines. There, quote, were neither in sensational technical advances nor sweeping extensions in markets in the paper industry during the 18th century. But it did undergo a, quote, slow but worthy, end quote, expansion. The number of mills grew and their distribution spread away from the concentration of Kent and Buckinghamshire to the West Midlands in particular. But by 1800, there are mills in virtually every county driven by the need for paper in all the expanding industries, a typical mill costing between four and five thousand pounds. Footnote. Pollard finds it unlikely that more than one or two firms had more than 200 employees. End footnote. While paper mills remained small and rural, stationers were concentrated in the rising towns doing a brisk trade. The two most significant developments were the application of the Hollander regime after 1730 and the application of chlorine after its discovery in 1774 to bleaching. In 1778, a combination of, quote, journeyman paper makers was noted in or near Manchester, and in 1790, some workers in the industry in Hertfordshire were indicted for conspiring to compel their employers to increase their wages, end quote. The 1790s brought a crisis to the paper industry in the form of inflation. Rags, labor costs, and taxation were all rising sharply, and there were calls for mechanization. When the paper-making machine was introduced from France in the first decade of the 19th century, it, quote, represented a straightforward mechanization of what was formerly done by hand, end quote and brought about the retarded but, quote, entirely analogous, end quote, revolution in papermaking that was seen decades earlier in the textile trades. Machine-based paper factories did not begin to spread widely until 1830, after which they spread most quickly in Lancashire, Yorkshire, Durham, and Scotland, a development which, quote, almost certainly owed much to the ready availability of coal in these regions, end quote. Whilst the industry, quote, declined in the remoter areas distant from as accessible supplies, end quote. Landis writes that chemical production, quote, the most miscellaneous of industries, end quote, and the one in which scientific research played a larger part than in any other industry has been neglected by historians of the Industrial Revolution, Due to the advanced knowledge necessary to grasp the complexities of chemistry, its secondary importance next 
its secondary importance next to other industries and its, quote, unrevolutionary character, end quote, as an industry which saw little by way of productivity advances or any reorganization of the labor process. Yet advances in chemistry were absolutely necessary in order for the Industrial Revolution to happen. Quote, there was not enough cheap meadowland or sour milk in all the British Isles to whiten the cloth of Lancashire. Once the water frame and the mule replaced the spinning wheel and it would have taken undreamed of quantities of human urine to cut the grease of the raw wool consumed by the mills of the West Riding, end quote. Landis, 1991. Prior to 1750, work in chemicals was mostly subsumed under the operation in question, dyes and bleaches for textiles, grease for machinery, and special glazes for pottery. Linen was bleached by alternately boiling it with ashes and lactic acid, sour milk supplying, applying sun exposure between boiling, sulfuric acid known as, quote, vitriol, to medieval chemist was used in place of sour milk, but was prohibitively expensive. In 1736, the London pharmacist Joshua Ward and his partner John White, applying the method of the 17th century German-Dutch chemist Johann Glauber, used glass vessels to increase the scale of sulfuric acid production a thousandfold, thereby dramatically reducing the cost. John Roebuck of Sheffield was able to improve upon this method by replacing the glass vessels with lead containers, thus allowing industrial-scale production. In 1748, Roebuck and his partner Samuel Garbett transferred his acid manufactory and 50 workmen to Preston Pans, Scotland, in hope of expanding his sales to manufacturers in the growing linen industry there, but also in hope of maintaining the secrecy of his process. The process was patented in 1771, but when the partners set out to enforce it, the matter went before the courts and the patent was overturned the following year, as textile manufacturers discovered that sulfuric acid was not only cheaper but faster than lactic acid. Vitriol works spread rapidly. Footnote. As with Arkwright's water frame, the process was deemed not to be original. Roebuck quickly ran into financial difficulties and sold out to Garbett, who set up a second vitriol works in his native Birmingham, where demand was increasing in the up-and-coming brass, quote, toys trade, but soon disinvested himself of the whole enterprise. End footnote. Next footnote. Where lactic acid bleaching took up to eight months, sulfuric acid reduced the necessary time to about four months. End footnote. Subsequent developments in the industrial use of chemicals in Britain depended upon the discoveries of the French chemists. In fact, during the Napoleonic Wars, France leapt ahead of Britain in producing sodium carbonate, Soda based on the Leblanc and later the Solve process. Britain had to rely upon potassium carbonate, potash, for use in glass making, scouring, fulling, leather softening, bleaching, cleaning, gunpowder making, and alum making until soda works were widely established from the 1820s. Footnote. Landis writes that, quote, the really important research in theoretical and applied chemistry was being done abroad where the education of chemists was already more systematic and thorough than in Britain, end quote. But he recognized the difference in Britain's advance in that Britain enjoyed an economy of scale which made it the leader into the late 19th century. End footnote. Berthollet's isolation of chlorine in 1784, by contrast, led to major advances in Britain, combined with salt, sulfuric acid, yielded hydraulic acid as a byproduct, and from this chlorine could be produced. The industrial use of chlorine was slowed by its highly corrosive properties, and while after 1790 chlorine came into use as a bleaching agent, it was noxious and difficult to produce on site. 
1796, the French developed javel water, potassium hypochlorite, quote, which had remained a household cleaning agent, which has remained a household cleaning agent ever since, end quote, but which was not capable, excuse me, was not applicable to the growing textile industry. The quote was from Landis, 1991. Charles Tennant of Glasgow patented a method of passing the chlorine through a combination of lime and water, and this res reduced costs but had drawbacks. Charles Tennant's partner, Charles McIntosh, quote, solved the problem completely with his process for absorbing chlorine by dry lime, the first gas-solid reaction to the technically, excuse me, to be technically exploited, end quote. The patent was take footnote. The patent was taken out in Tennant's name, and Tennant is widely credited for the invention, but Hardy clarifies that Macintosh was the inventor. End footnote. This key in innovation, the discovery of bleaching powder, chloride of lime, quote, opened the floodgates of textile manufacture, end quote, by removing any significant limitation that would otherwise have been posed by the limited options available for bleaching. Footnote, quote, in the history of the first 75 years of the chemical industry, end quote, writes Hardy, quote, it is almost impossible to overemphasize the significance of chloride of lime, end quote. There is an obvious parallel here with the steam engine in that without this innovation, the growth of industry would have been limited until some other alternative for expanding the ease and scale of bleaching was found. End footnote. By 1814, Tennant would go on to buy out his partners in the St. Rolox works near Glasgow, which on the strength of bleaching powder sales would become easily the largest chemical works in the world by the 1830s. Macintosh went on to make several additional discoveries, including naphtha rubber for making, quote, life preservers, end quote, namely rain jackets, new processes that would lead to advances in steel making and a process of using coal tar, a waste product which up to that point had simply been dumped into rivers as a furnace fuel. Quote, coal tar, end quote, writes Hardy, quote, was the subject of one of those peculiar reversals of technological importance by which the byproduct of a process becomes more important than the product for which it was originally carried on, end quote. Hardy. Footnote. This was no doubt a trade-off in the form of polluting the air instead of polluting the water, but the savings ran into the millions of pounds. End footnote. Such a recycling of waste produ product provided, quote, a powerful stimulus to innovation, end quote, writes Landis, as there was, quote, the positive lure of profit, end quote. Quote. Footnote. Quote, the, history, the story of chemicals in the first two-thirds of the 19th century is in large part this effort to use up all the materials, end quote. Landis, in addition to the profits to be earned from a new enterprise, there were the additional savings to the manufacturer in the form of having less lawsuits to contend with. End footnote. Two other chemical entrepreneurs merit discussion. In 1738, William Champion of Bristol patented a process for distilling zinc from zinc oxide and set up a manufactory. Excuse me, a manufactory. The making of quality brass had depended upon zinc imports from India, and in response to Champion's initial success, East Indian traders drastically lowered their zinc prices, forcing Champion to revert to using calamine in his brass works at Warmly. When his patent was extended in 1750, it was opposed by metal workers. Champion went bankrupt in 1769, and his story serves as not only another example of an event inventor who failed as a businessman, but as the typical British entrepreneur interested in innovation for profit rather than state prizes. His contributions spurred on the brass metalworking trades of Birmingham, 
James Keir, a member of the Lunar Society, had set up a glassworks at Stourbridge near Birmingham in 1772, where he experienced, excuse me, experimented in alkalis. His partners were the Birmingham industrialist John Taylor and the vitriol manufacturer Samuel Ski. He abandoned the glassworks in 1778 to set up a soap and alkali factory in Tipton, where he pioneered in organizational innovations in the chemical industry. After 1799, excuse me, footnote. Keir's connection to the Lunar Society is important as both Wedgwood and Bolton were members. This strongly suggests that the Lunar Society's members discussed far more than just science. End footnote. After 1799, many industries began manufacturing their own chemicals on site, but chemical works also spread. Aside from the Glasgow area, the two other centers of chemical industry in Britain were the Tyneside, where access to water, transport, and coal was abundant, and Merseyside, with easy access to coal and Cheshire salt. Concentrating on soda ash for making soap and sodium sulfate for glass making. Chemistry was another capital-intensive industry where the concentration of labor was small, only 9,127 adult workers in the whole industry by 1851, over a thousand of which worked at St. Rolou alone. But its importance, quote, was clearly out of proportion to its numbers or even its capital investment, end quote. Footnote. George Mackintosh, father of Charles and maker of boots and shoes, had joined in a partnership with George and Cuthbert Gordon in erecting and operating a dye manufactory in Dunchatton. The factory was circled by a high wall with which, which, within which with 500 Scottish Highlanders worked. Like the factory of Rubuck and Garbett at Crustal ponds, the wall, and in this case, the employment of Gaelic-speaking workers who rarely left the compound were apparently efforts to protect secrets of the process. It, quote, must have been one of the strangest factories in the records of industry, end quote. By its size, it was probably the largest of its time. In a word, it was exceptional. End footnote. There are a host of other industries that are of interest, such as sugar refining, soap boiling, glass making, and coach making, to name a few. These industries remain small in scale and few saw, major, saw few major technical developments in the 18th century. One industry which emerged purely out of an accidental discovery was the gas works. In 1604, one Reverend John Clapton of Wigan noticed flames on the water that he later determined to be gas released from a nearby coal mine. Nearly two centuries later, the gas lamp was invented, perhaps simultaneously, by William Murdoch, an engineer at the Soho factory, the first building to be lit with gas lighting, and Philip Le Bon of Paris, who used it to light his house and gardens. Soon, cities like London and Paris would erect gas lamps along the parks and walkways powered with gas piped in from the new gas works. The Capitalist where did the entrepreneurs, the capitalists of the Industrial Revolution themselves, come from? In agriculture, as we have seen, landlords themselves were actively involved in supplying capital for improving the farms they leased. The Duke of Bridgewater set the Canal Revolution in motion by investing exorbitant amounts of capital, both his own and that he borrowed. Thus, landowners were themselves major investors. Merchants and manufacturers also invested in the turnpike roads, canals, and the later, later the railroads. Urban improvement schemes were invested in as well, 
and open up opportunities for the middle classes who could be, quote, part of a pluralistic property endeavor for improvement, end quote. Hay and Rogers, 1997. In general, awareness of both the risks and the potential for very lucrative gains to be made by getting in on any number of emerging investment opportunities was widespread in the 18th century British society. By 1750, there is already, quote, unmistakable evidence of a rising rate of capital accumulation in roads, canals, buildings, and agricultural enclosures, end quote. Dean and Cole, 1969. Footnote. Dean and Cole add, quote, If parliamentary enclosures can be taken as evidence of increased investment in reproducible capital of agriculture, fences, buildings, equipment, livestock, etc., the fact that the acreage statutorily enclosed in the period of 1761 to 92 was seven times that of the preceding three decades is significant enough, end quote. The conversion of land to capital may in fact have been the fundamental development in the creation of a capitalist economy. End footnote. The landed gentry often supplied the capital needed for larger industrial projects, projects, while the entrepreneurs themselves would often be the younger sons of landed families who had the contacts, the resources, and access to education and training to develop their talents as industrialists. Many Among the early entrepreneurs, few started out as laborers. Many, if not most, had access to savings in their own family or the family into which they had married. Their position demanded organizational skills. These included marketing, maintaining a careful oversight of management, ensuring the supply of raw materials, was steady and, and of good quality, and sufficient understanding of the technology they employed to be able to apply it to the production process. Footnote. An example in the 17th century was the wealthy Flemish merchant William Courtine, a lender to the crown who had organized an interloping expedition to East India in 1635. Courtine purchased the manor of Laxton in Nottinghamshire, quote, obviously with the intention of making his estates pay, end quote. The governor of the East Anglia India Company, Sir John Banks, married his daughter to the Earl of Aylesford and earned a fortune off his rent roll. In the 18th century, Arkwright, Richard Arkwright and Sir Robert Peel both, quote, acquired titles, bought estates, built country houses, and founded landed families, end quote. According to the Stones, however, these were exceptional cases, and in general, the landed elite enjoyed a kind of cultural isolation which gave them a general monopoly on power and status prizes, which for now eluded the industrialists. End footnote. Only rarely did they themselves demonstrate a great talent for invention. This talent more often rose from the ranks of working men. Those who came up with new methods of production and the inventions that flowed from them were probably for the most part wage laborers or journeymen and were rarely credited for their contributions. Quote, Many of the first engineers and machine builders, Joseph Clements, Brahma, Henry Maudsley, were sons of peasants or humble weavers, and they began life as carpenters and blacksmiths, end quote. The Duke of Bridgewater's engineer, James Brinley, was from a successful family of craftsmen and farmers in the Peak District, but had no formal education as a child. The transition from a manufacturing base characterized by independent domestic workers owning their own looms or spinning wheels or renting them from the merchant who, quote, put out the raw materials they worked to a manufacturing base ba characterized by factories or operations considerably larger in scale than the typical workshop in 1700, with perhaps a dozen or less persons employed, came about through a process involving a multitude of, quote, shifts in the economy. Matthias provides two key examples. First, many of the early entrepreneurs originated in closely related branches of industry shifting operations from merchandising to the production of their goods. Second, many merchants who relied on the domestic system and who were aggravated by the inconsistency of the supply were compelled to assume control over part of the production process. Quote, Many grain merchants are 
maltsters, maltsters became brewers or set up a son as a brewer. The characteristic industrialist in the woolen industry had set up a factory from being a, quote, putter-outer or a woolen merchant. An instance of this sequence was Benjamin Gott of Leeds, who went into woolen production to fulfill the demands of regularity of supplies and consistency of quality which he needed as a merchant. In the metal industries, most of the iron masters had been in the secondary metal trades, making final products from refined metal, and they then moved back to making iron, end quote. Taking direct control of a production operation allowed merchants to ensure the quality and supply of commodities. It also allowed them to control and to upgrade production techniques in order to provide goods of uniform quality and sufficient supply to the buyer. This, making this, quote, shift also allowed them, quote, to bypass public markets and the independent merchants who owned and distributed raw materials to small manufacturers buying themselves from the importer's and laying down their own specifications, end quote. In the face of competition within rapidly expanding markets, these factors became imperatives if one wanted to stay in the game. The quote, market, writes Matthias, quote, decided the nature of production, end quote, quoting Charles Wilson, who wrote that the role of entrepreneur required, quote, a sense of opportunity combined with the capacity to exploit it, end quote. New economic roles emerged as new economic habits and practices came into being. A, quote, class of industrial capitalists did not suddenly appear on the scene either as the effect of an industrial revolution or as its cause. For Matthias, they formed a type but not a class, given that they, quote, arrived from every social class and from all parts of the country, end quote. This type however, fulfilled particular needs driven by economic imperatives in an extraordinary economic context, one of rapidly expanding markets in an expanding empire, markets driven by competition in a way as never before. Quote, If the momentum of expansion was to be maintained, end quote, writes Matthias, quote, unscrupulous, end quote, industrialists were compelled to adopt, quote, instruments which increased the exploitation of labor, end quote. These instruments included, quote, long pay, end quote, or, in the place of cash wages, issuing tokens or credit slips as titles to purchase in the Tommy shops. Ashton has argued that the government's inability to provide a steady supply of currency is partly to blame for the problems these shortcuts were meant to stem. But these problems are specific to the imperative to expand faced by the early industrial capitalists. Where they existed in the past, they were never so acute. Aside from short-changing workers, another means to increase the rate of expansion was credit. Currency supply was a money problem. Credit in this context is a problem of the movement of capital. In the age of guilds, when the goal was to establish a monopoly over markets in the name of ensuring the high quality of the product, markets were conceptualized as more or less static. Credit played a role in lubricating the commercial transactions of mar merchants, but there was no imperative to progressively expand units of production and thus a limited need for credit. Once a company gained monopoly control of a given market by charter, competition was eliminated and so any competitive imperative to expand, innovate, or maximize production was reduced or even minimized. Under conditions of agrarian and then emerging industrial capitalism, however, the market imperative to expand production generates an urgent and permanent demand for credit as what one might call an artificial means of accelerating the movement of capital through the circuit of production, exchange, and reinvestment. Matthias notes that, quote, in the pre-factory domestic system, almost all capital lay in stocks of materials, with a very small fraction indeed in fixed assets such as buildings or machinery. Even in the early factories, in textiles, breweries, and the like, amongst the most heavily capitalized, less than one-seventh or one-eighth of total assets typically were in buildings and plant. Six-sevenths to seven-eighths and more still being absorbed by, quote, movables, end quote or, quote, circulating capital, end quote. 
raw materials, goods in the pipeline, goods being sold but not yet paid for, end quote. Matthias, 1983. As the Industrial Revolution progressed, these ratios would shift toward heavier and heavier outlays in fixed capital, but in the early days of the factory system, investment lay preponderantly in circulating capital. We may note, however, that Professor Matthias fails to include the wages of labor among the elements of circulating capital. The importance of this omission will become apparent below. Given such a low ratio of fixed to circulating capital, it meant that the early factor ma factory masters were mainly in need of sources of short-term credit. As we have seen, the rise of the country banks in the late 18th century came to their aid. Before the arrival of the country bank, however, the entrepreneur had to rely heavily on either personal resources or personal acquaintances, family members, friends, and business associates to cover not only short-term capital needs, but also to accumulate enough capital to start a business or to invest in buildings and equipment. Early on, it was possible to set up a new business with one's own resources if they were sufficient. Owen Watt, Arkwright, Marshall, and the Darbys and Wilkinson's all used personal resources or borrowed from friends and family to get started. Once established, it was essential to reinvest profits into the enterprise, which at least when they were starting all out, often meant abstinence or strict discipline involving limiting spending for the entrepreneur and his family. When profits were insufficient, loans were required. Since success depended so heavily on the organizational, managerial, and marketing abilities of the entrepreneur, quote, Respectability, end quote, was important. Those with whom one did business with regularly were less reticent to lend, particularly those working in a related branch of the same industry. Hence, quote, spinning mill owners were the main source of capital for the provision of power looms in Lancashire in the 1820s and 1830s, end quote. Eventually, an elaborate system of credit arose that would be able to meet the demands for large-scale loans to finance large-scale projects of the 19th century, specifically the railroads. By that time, the scale of such enterprises had outgrown the sole proprietor model, and corporate enterprise was a prerequisite. By the late 18th century, the ratio of fixed to circulating capital required to start and sustain a firm was becoming significant. For the entrepreneur, considering his investment choices, this raised the stakes. Quote, in an effort to reduce his own share of the risks of a cyclical fall in demand, he shifted as much as it, of it as he could onto his labor force. Hence the long, drawn-out agony of the handloom weavers who bore most of the losses of the early 19th century cotton trade slumps, end quote. Credit provided the mechanism by which savings could be mobilized for investment. 18th century England was a country comparatively wealthy in savings. One might venture footnote. One might venture to guess that it outstripped all its rivals in this category, and that we could credit this to agrarian capitalism. The difficulty lay in finding a way to leverage credit for the use of borrowers. As we have seen, this void was filled by the various mechanisms of credit that developed. But what was the source of the savings that was translated into the capital that fueled the Industrial Revolution? Matthias points to land. Quote, an important direct flow of savings from the land being created from farming profits and agricultural rents fertilized agricultural improvement, mining, transport improvements, and turnpike trust and canals. One country banks, once country banks were established in most market towns in the second half of the 18th century, another conduit for transfers of rural savings came into action. At the same time, other flows of capital came back to the land and new, with new recruits to the landed classes. From commerce, industry, and the professions, it is impossible to say if the net flow was toward or away from the land, end quote. Matthias. Footnote. Nope, no footnote. One area of the economy where a great deal of wealth was transferred from the land was canal building in the form of locally raised funds, starting, as we have seen, with the Duke of Bridgewater. Footnote. Quote. In most cases, the new navigations 
were the product of corporate enterprise initiated by local businessmen and landowners and supported by shareholders and bankers and city corporations, even sometimes by universities. End quote. Oh yeah, that quote was by Dean. Sorry, I spaced out for a second. The canal boom made it clear that there was indeed an abundance of capital in England in the late 18th century. Dean points out that during the canal building era, England was not short of capital per se, only of productive capital. Quote, there was a good deal of capital invested in the funds, in land, and in game preserves, in country houses, yielding a very low return indeed in either money or in goods and services compared with what it could with what it could be made to yield in canals and turnpike trusts and could dean david ricardo would complain in 1817 that the unproductive nature of many of their investments put the interest of the landed class generally at odds with the greater progress of capitalism by contrast, investment in transport had a multiplier effect on the economy by reducing costs, opening access to new markets and new business relationships, increasing confidence and security, and reducing turnover times, and so speaking, speeding up the rate of profit. Quote, the fact is that an efficient market, whether it be in goods or capital or men or ideas, depends largely on a rapid and free flow of information as well as of things. End quote. Dean. By 1815, perhaps as much as 20 million pounds had been invested in canals, an enormous sum for the times. Yet this money was being invested at a time when virtually all sectors of the economy were seeing increasing investment. Rentier, cap inve excuse me, rentier investment was only one source. We must also consider the profits being made in capitalist tenant farming and the emerging capitalist industries. In both cases, the increasing rate of the exploitation of labor may provide a key. To elaborate, it is necessary to discuss briefly how different authors appear to have different understandings of capital. Origins and Definitions of Capital the term, quote, capital, is used fast and loose throughout the literature, but it seems clear that not all are in agreement as to capital's definition. The work of economic historians like Dean, Matthias, and others is vital to establishing accurate understanding of the complexity and gradual nature of the process that is the Industrial Revolution. As we have just seen from their work, we gain the understanding that the, quote, capitalist did not simply emerge one day as a category of economic agency, but that the role emerged gradually and out of various economic shifts and different social backgrounds. Yet it appears that, quote, capital for these authors, excuse me, for these authors is strictly an economic term, an umbrella category that encompasses the investor's cash, the industrialist's stores, stock of raw material, and forms of credit. In other words, the term is inclusive of all the forms that capital takes as it moves through the cycle of production, circulation, and investment in production. All the forms save one, but there is little discussion of capital taking the form of commodified labor. <laughs> there is, nor is there much consideration of the social implications of land or access to land coming to be treated as a commodity. Let us call this the economic or static definition of capital. It is in short a definition that restricts capital to the pantheon of economic terminology, thereby avoiding a careful examination of capital itself as a manifestation of a unique set of social relationship as a relationships as a web of social relations. Quote, capital is treated as a universal concept potentially present in all societies where there is a trade ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China, or perhaps even in central, excuse me, in ancient Kerala in the Andes. <laughs> 
despite the recognition that an unprecedented growth of capital is taking place simultaneously with the Industrial Revolution, restricted to its economic aspect, capital can grow in quantity, but its universal quality remains unchanged. A second definition, what we might call a social or dynamic definition, and the one pursued in this study, would see capital not simply as the financial and material resources of owner-employers, but as a social relationship and a form of property that is market-dependent. The social relation of capital arises not of a situation, not arises out, the social relation of capital arises out of a situation in which the transformation of production in response to market indicators becomes not a choice but an imperative necessary for the economic survival of the market-dependent owner of the means of production to whom all the profits of production accrue. The owner is thereby compelled to assert legal rights of legal ownership over all the inputs of the production process, including not only raw materials but also land, labor, and money. The spread of the capital relation and the growing market dependence of both direct producers and surplus appropriators was appropriators both stimulated and are reinforced by the growth of the national domestic market. Where during the transitional period that saw the rise of agrarian capitalism in England, the transformation of production by way of converting land to capital was central. It was the conversion of labor to capital that was more central to the Industrial Revolution. Condonel. In Chapter 3, we considered two major sources of the capital that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Investment and credit, which are but two sides of the same coin, those authors using the static definition of capital tend to think of an increase in the nation's capital as roughly equivalent to an increasing rate of investment. Thus, Dean points out that capital grew faster between 1750 and 1800 than between 1700 and 1750, while in that same first half century, England and Wales saw a 50% growth in the population a doubling of the national income, and a tripling in the volume of overseas trade. <laughs> Given these enormous rates of growth, Dean concludes that for the century between 1750 to 1850, quote, the level of invest investment would have had to increase by something like 50% just to keep the capital stock growing at the same rate as the labor force, end quote. Yet there is, quote, no convincing support, end quote, for the hypothesis that there was an increase in savings large enough to double the rate of investment. Dean. Dean and Cole cite Lewis, who claims that while underdeveloped countries just have saved just 6% of their national income, developed countries save 12% or more. They also cite Rostow, who argues that for a country to be able to produce Britain's industrial, quote, takeoff, a 5 to 10% increase of savings is required. Yet if the growth of savings did not meet these standards in the planet's first industrial revolution, then where did the capital come from to enable a 50% increase in the level of investment between 1750 and 1800? Footnote. Lewis actually defines the term industrial revolution according to the investment rate. Quote, all countries which are now relatively developed have at some time in the past gone through a period of rapid acceleration in the course of which the rate of annual net investment has moved from 5% to less or less to 12% or more. This is what we mean by an industrial revolution. End quote. It would be hard to find a more brazenly economistic definition of the term industrial revolution. If social science could be reduced to such tidy equations, there would be little work left to do. End footnote. One moment, I gotta blow my nose. <laughs>
By way of addressing the problem, Dean pursues the question of when the upward shift in capital formation took place. He cast doubt upon Rustow's claim that a doubling of capital formation took place between 1783 and 1802 for three reasons. One, there is evidence of prior capital formation. Two, the development of those two decades were not massive enough for this kind of impact. Three, the railway age still to come had a totally unprecedented impact and would serve as a more likely period. For this, thus for Dean, the evidence suggests that the sharp upturn more likely took place after 1830 during the railroad boom and peak period of mechanization in the cotton industry, followed by the mechanization of the woolen industry after 1850. The evidence assembled by Dean and Cole do point to 1830 or 1832 as a real break point in the trends. Yet the problem remains, how did capital formation before 1832 and indeed before 1800, keep pace with an unprecedented growth of population, trade, and income. <laughs> Throughout the literature, it is pointed out that savings were not in short supply in 18th century Britain, only the means of leveraging savings into investment. Are we to conclude, then, that the growth of the banks in London and the country was sufficient to leverage enough extant savings to account for a 50% growth in the level of investment between 1750 and 1800? No doubt their unprecedented growth during the period did mean a greatly expanded funnel through which otherwise idle savings could be converted into investment. But this can hardly account for the difference. Also widely pointed out in the literature is the fact that early industry required minimal investment in fixed capital, but the proportion of fixed to circulating capital grew as time wore on. Thus, investment... Sorry, one second. Outlays in early industry would have started out at low levels, but would have grown steadily. Still, the growth of banks and a low investment threshold for industry cannot explain a doubling of the national income and a tripling in the volume of overseas trade, nor just investment, but capital had to grow and grow exponentially. Oh. Let us suggest that a static definition of capital is incapable of explaining this growth because it takes a warehousing approach to the problem. Sticking to quantitative accounting and sidestepping issues of qualitative transformation, how many pounds were shifted from savings to investment? How much income from, the foreign, from foreign trade was put back into production? How much of the national income did the landed classes consume? These questions of accounting are essential to good analysis, but we learn very little about the social dimensions of capital from such trade-offs. Following Gregory King, the cl closest to a concise definition of capital given by Dean and Cole is, quote, quote, productive and reproductive nas reproducible national capital, end quote, end quote. Dean and Cole citing Gregory King, 1969. They are at pains to point out that the whole effort to quantify the rate of capital formation, especially for the 18th century, for which no record exists, is, quote, highly conjectural, end quote. How is capital formed? All, all that we can learn from accounts that employ a static definition of capital is that capital grows when the technical instruments, the buildings, and the commodities involved in production increase. How do they increase? More money is invested or more profits are reinvested in production. Capital is effectively treated as just stock. Capital moves from one part of the national warehouse to the other and it gets exported and money or other goods return to take its place. Dean and Cole have remarkably little to say about the role that, that capital played in the social transformation that accompanied the Industrial Revolution. To address this requires an understanding of capital as a form of property. Unlike the factory master's stock, the term property immediately invokes the existence of social institutions such as the courts, the legislature, and ultimately the state. 
Another related problem with attempting to... Sorry, one second. Another related problem with attempting to measure the national capital of Britain before, during, and after the Industrial Revolution is one of defining relative values. Suppose the arable land is to be included in our accounting of the nation's capital. What is the value of land? We can derive a number for average rent per acre and multiply that by the total arable farmland. But what of enclosed land, unenclosed lands that are not subject to market rents and market principles? Our calculation will be skewed, and in 1700 only half the land in England was enclosed. Footnote. In developing or, under, in developing or underdeveloped countries today, the problem is similar. Indian environmental activist Vandana Shiva, commenting on the Green Revolution that revolutionized agriculture in India and other developing countries from around the 1970s, writes, quote, Biological products which are not sold on the market but used as inputs for maintaining soil fertility were totally ignored by the cost-benefit equations of the Green Revolution miracle. They did not appear in the list of inputs because they were not purchased, nor in the last in a list of outputs because they were not sold. Yet what was seen as, quote, unproductive or, quote, waste in the commercial context of the Green Revolution is now emerging as productive in the ecological context and as the only route to sustainable agriculture, end quote. Elsewhere, Shiva has pointed out in her work that in one year in the late 1980s or early 1990s, the Indian government created the appearance of a sharp burst in economic growth where there was none, simply by including for the first time statistics for non-market agricultural production under traditional methods. End footnote. It is no wonder that Dean and Cole's attempt at measuring the growth of Britain's national capital in the 18th and 19th centuries is highly conjectural. <laughs> It is an economy where land in, its, in both its commodified form and land in its non-commodified form exists side by side with a process at work converting the one into the other. The same can be said for labor. In such an economy, there exist dual methods for calculating values, even if one method is ascendant. The problem is that these dual methods involve more than quantitative problems. They are the respective products of different sets of social relations, different cultures, and different meanings. The political economist had a hard time of it as well. As McCloskey points out, quote, economics was for a, for a long, sue me, quote, economics was for long a British, even disproportionately a Scottish subject. What, it, what is odd is that the British economist did not recognize the factor of 12 as it was happening. The economist theories took useful account of little changes, a 5% rise of income when the cotton textiles grew, or 10% fall when Napoleon ruled the continent. But they did not notice that the change to be explained, 1780 to 1850, was not 10%, but 100%, on its way to 1,100%. Only recently has the inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations begun to recognize this astonishing oversight." End quote. The quote, factor of 12, excuse me, end quote, that was uh, McCloskey. The quote, factor of 12, mentioned here by McCloskey, is referring to the quote, factor by which real income per head nowadays, bracket, circa 1980, end bracket, exceeds that around 1780, in Britain and in even other countries that have experienced modern economic growth, end quote. McCloskey reviews all the possible factors to explain the factor of 12 and comes up with nothing but knots, quote, knots, end quote. When one factor in population growth between 1780, excuse me, when one, when one factors in population growth between 1780 and 1980, the factor of 12 translates into a much more astronomical sum in terms of overall economic growth. McCloskey credits the historian Thomas Babington McCulley for standing almost alone amongst his contemporaries in being able to consider the implications of contemporary trends of economic growth. In 1830, that watershed moment for Dean and Cole, McCulley wrote, quote, 
If we were to prophesy that in the year 1930 a population of 50 million, better fed, clad, and lodged than the English of our time, will cover these islands, that Sussex and Huntingdonshire will be wealthier than the wealthiest parts of the West Riding of Yorkshire now are, that machines constructed on principles yet undiscovered will be in every house, many people would think it us insane, end quote. McCloskey, 1994, citing, citing McCulley, 1858. Why should it take a historian to grasp what the, econ what the economists could not? And why are economists still searching for a convincing hypothesis to explain the phenomenal growth of the Industrial Revolution? One might at least consider looking to the exploitation of labor as holding some of the answers to this dilemma. If Dean and Cole exclude labor power, from their accounting of the national capital, they exclude the possibility of accounting for the phenomenal growth of capital by considering how methods of squeezing more surplus labor out of the laborer were used to progressively increase the capitalist profit. And in the process, to allow capital to, quote, self-expand, end quote. It may not be sufficient to account for how much capital is moved from one part of the warehouse to another, or in and out of the warehouse, perhaps the stock is growing where it sits. <laughs> Footnote. Of course, for authors of the Gradualist School, beginning with Clapham, as discussed at the outset of this work, this growth was not a quote as quote phenomenal end quote as others may think. End footnote. Next footnote. What is meant by this is that the industrialist store of commodities in the warehouse represents only one phase in a circuit of the reproduction of capital, in which value is constantly being added in the production process itself. We are not referring to any appreciation of value in the conventional sense of increasing demand or shrinking supply pushing up prices, but rather to the value that is invested in the product in the process of production. All right, I'm on page 500, baby. We're moving through this thing. Conclusion. Innovation is a creative process, one requiring conscious effort. The Industrial Revolution did not simply spring forth from the, quote, interstices of post-feudal early modern British society. New institutions such as the factory had to be imagined, built, organized, financed, and regulated. While we have tried to lay out how conditions for the emergence of factories and the general upturn in industrial output across Britain was propitious, were propitious, this does not mean that it was inevitable that Wedgwood would be revolutionized the pottery trade, that cotton factories based on the water frame and the mule would number in the hundreds by 1800, or that Watt would discover the separate condenser engine. What science and technical innovation have in common is that they proceeded by moving from one problem to the next, each new problem posing a challenge to find a solution. With hindsight, we can trace the evolution of discovery and change, but hindsight quickly lapses into tunnel vision when the path of discovery and evolution begins to appear like a single path directed towards the telos of the present. Starting, excuse me, staring into the future, the scientists and inventors of the Industrial Revolution could no more accurately predict what discoveries lay ahead than their contemporary counterparts can foresee the discoveries of the future. At the same time, however, forecasting is not complete guesswork. We can identify what problems are being worked on, what solutions are being sought, and suggest probable outcomes. The confusion comes when, in looking at the past, we lose sight of the fact that multiple outcomes were possible and presume that there was only one. Shit. Sure. 
It is crucial to bear this in mind as we consider the broader forces at work in the Industrial Revolution, so while we have seen how the introduction of the factory required the willful act of inculcating habits of time thrift in the place of task orientation, or substituting a machine for the manual skill of the craft worker, these actions did not take place in a social and economic vacuum. Any worker these excuse me, any analysis that shows how the course of economic change threw up general problems that were solved in specific circum instances with specific solution runs the risk of being dismissed as, quote, economistic, quote, determinist, or, quote, teleological. These charges should not deter us from seeking to identify the broader forces at work in social and economic change for the alternatives to simply lapse into analysis that only considers what is contingent and specific. The goal should be to produce analysis that can situate specific developments within the broader course of historical change while ascribing inevitability to neither. This means that broad broader scale change, while more immutable, is also open to other possibilities. This can be identified in terms of limitations set by technological factors. For example, had the separate condenser engine not been discovered, the spread of textile factories would have continued to rely on water power, which would soon have reached an upper limit beyond which the system could not expand. It can be identified at the political level, for example, had Spain managed to land at least one of its armados, conquer England, and overthrow Elizabeth, it is possible that the Spanish crown could have sought to establish an economy on the same foundations as Spanish absolutism, thereby possibly extinguishing agrarian capitalism and even terminating the development of capitalism itself. So bearing in mind with due diligence that there were other people outside with possible or other possible outcomes, let us consider some of the broader work forces at work in making up the historical context in which the crucial innovations of the West the Industrial Revolution occur. Let us start specifically with competition. We know that in agrarian capitalism, the competition that compelled tenant farmers to introduce new techniques on their farms was a factor of the emerging market in land leases wherein the farmer who failed to innovate risked being unable to pay the rent and so lose the farm. How did competition in manufactures come about? The short answer is that markets themselves were transformed. Throughout the 18th century, an increasingly unregulated for labor force emerged. As At the same time, we see the emergence of increasingly large-scale manufacturing operations of varying type. The growth of the domestic market and of population both contributes to these both contribute to these developments. And in the first instance, we can trace both of these developments to the prior emergence of agrarian capitalism, which does several things. First, it lifts the ceiling on population growth by expanding the food supply. Second, it divorces direct producers from the means of subsistence, creating an expanding supply of labor for manufacturers. Third, agriculture itself becomes subject to market imperatives, creating self-sustaining growth, which we explored in Chapter 3. Key to this change is the way in which the tenant farmers themselves are re rendered market-dependent and enclosing landlords themselves become dependent upon markets in land and labor to guarantee their rental income. What is the parallel transition in manufacturers? In making this analysis, let us analogy, let us first recognize that manufacturers had no lordly class as such. Craft workers were subjects of a state dominated by the power of a class whose economic base was rooted in the ownership of land, but unlike peasants, they did not pay feudal dues or rents. The paradox of domestic manufacturers is that while custom continued to regulate their mode of production longer than it did in agriculture, they had always been by definition market dependent in a double sense since they were both divorced from the means of subsistence and also relied upon the sale of their products in the marketplace. But, but, royal, but royal charters and customary norms of organization relations in the workshop meant that manufacturers, while commercially oriented, were not capitalist. Asking how the capitalist entrepreneur came, became market dependent is tautological. We must first ask how the merchant, the small master, or anybody else became a capitalist, as in a factory master. <laughs>
So long as the division of labor between merchants who handled trade and craftsmen who controlled both the means of production and the labor process survived, the revolution in industry would not be complete. In the previous chapter, we saw how through the composition of a detailed division of labor in pottery and factory machinery and cotton spinning, capitalists such as Wedgwood and Arkwright pioneered the real subordination of labor to capital in the woolen and worsted industries. As a far more diverse set of developments arose, the labor factory owner, excuse me, the large factory owner like Benjamin Gott was the exception, and even Gott's operation was not only heavily dependent upon domestic outworkers, but this is this was a dependence which, as we shall see, could still bring his entire operation to a halt. The more characteristic development of the factory in the woolen districts of West Riding is the emergence of small operations combining fulling mines, mills, slubbing billies, and scribbling engines, and converted corn mills in a manner that generally did not disturb domestic weaving and spinning. Some of these, quote, company mills apparently operate on a cooperative basis, with workers exercising a degree of collective control over production in a setting of a small factory. in the setting of a small factory. While others were run by small owners with varying degrees of adherence to customary norms of organizing labor, meanwhile independent producers and small masters had long had long made significant headway using the Jenny and Shuttle Loom, while Gott, the merchant turned manufacturer, serves as a classic example of Marx's way too, the general development of the woolen industry in West Riding conforms perhaps more closely than any other example to Marx's, quote, truly revolutionary, end quote, way, or, quote, way one, in which the small producer gains control over the production process and becomes a capitalist. While delayed by difficulties in developing machinery and disadvantages of geography, the Worstead districts of West Riding appear to have followed a more straightforward path toward the large spinning and weaving factory. While the adaption of spinning to flax by Kendrew and Porthouse in 1787, Lennon also appeared to have moved quickly toward the factory, with Marshall as the counterpart part to Gott or Arkwright. The case of the West of England reminds us that regional competition played an important role in shaping outcomes. Here, early enclosures appear to have had the paradoxical effect of more firmly entrenching customary norms and expectations in woolen spinning and weaving, allowing for stronger resistance to the introduction of machinery, including the jenny and the shuttle loom, with the long-term result that the west of England was unable to withstand the price competition from the relatively more rapid advance of machinery, even among domestic producers in West Riding. One must also remember that by serving as a competing region of woolen production, the west of England played a role in the development of capitalist and mechanical woolen production in West Riding. Before the arrival of the paper-making machine and after 1830, the paper mill resembled the company mill in Woolens being a small manufacturing operation with a simple division of labor. What the expansion in the number of paper mills throughout England attests to, however, is the extraordinary expansion of the domestic market and domestic demand. Brewing provides a striking case of an industry rapidly converted to a capitalist structure of labor organization. This is made easy by the fact that brewing requires minimal labor and that minimal machinery, since the ability to expand the size of the vat and utensils to mammoth size was and probably remains the surest way to meet price competition by producing on an economy of scale. Metallurgy, much like clock making, generally remain the preserve of the domestic craftsman or work craftswoman. Bolton's manufactory was exceptional in this regard, although, as in mining, the structure of the independent workshop was largely preserved inside the manufactory. Moreover, the sheer range of products being produced probably made it difficult to establish the same degree of labor discipline. Such deficiencies in the ability to effect necessary changes in the production process as required by market competition were overcome when Bolton and Watts, starting from an entirely new blueprint, had ensured that they would enjoy complete control over the production process, established the Soho foundry that producing, for producing separate condenser engines. A parallel would be seen at Colebrookdale when the Darbys found that the production of steam engines made up for the decline of profitability in the small cast iron wares trade. 
The striking thing about the not iron and coal production, excuse me, the striking thing about iron and coal production is that despite the absence of a major revolutions in the means of production, these were able to expand after 1782 at a rate of sufficient to keep the textile revolution going, and la later, the railroad boom. There were generally two ways that the scale of production could be increased without revolutionizing the production process. Fist, as in brewing, front foundries, excuse me, first, excuse me, first, as in brewing foundries and forges, excuse me, as in first, as in brewing, foundries and forges were able to expand the scale of output without revolutionizing the means of production in any way other than increasing the size of the forge, furnace, bellows, and hammers. The second way was to expand the size of the workforce. To a great extent, this is what happened in mining where new mines were opened up and metalworking were, where the size of the tool was enlarged. The buddy system is a good example of the formal subsumption of labor to the capital and the way in which such operations were becoming capitalist in their overall orientation. Whilst retaining useful aspects of earlier customary forms of labor organization, the buddy or team leader was himself subject to market pressures to reduce costs by exploiting his workmen, a break from customary norms of labor organization and one very much driven by the increasingly cheap supply of labor. Under this system, we do not see the development of highly subdivided tasks as the workmen still maintain direct control of the labor process. But employment for the colliers was increasingly insecure as large employers were increasingly able to access an emerging national labor market in which labor was increasingly commodified. As the supply of labor increased, even those industries where the factory system was not developing, there was a growing tendency towards viewing labor is simply one input among others in the production process, or in other words, as abstract labor or as capital. In the coming chapters, we will visit examples of how in these industries the movement from a formal to a real subsumption of labor continued, but was a long and protracted process. To the extent that the commodification of labor presupposes a social property relationship between a class of owner-employers paying wages in exchange for the labor power of a class of free workers, we might expect to see clear evidence of these classes by the late 18th century. In case of employers, we have seen that in nearly every industry there were industrialists accumulating large amounts of wealth and stock and employing hundreds and in some cases thousands of laborers at their operations. Wilkinson and Crawshay in iron, Williams and copper, Arkwright, Strutt and Peel in cotton, Gott and partners in wool, Marshall in linen, Taylor, Bolton and Champion in metallurgy, Barclay in brewing, and so on. Certainly they were amassing capital in the static sense, and we have been at pains to suggest that while the social relation of capital was first established in agriculture, the rate at which the conversion from traditional manufacturers regulated by custom and monopoly to the formal subsumption of labor to capital, to the real subsumption of labor to capital varied in different lines of manufacturing. We have seen how many of the early industrialists were enthusiasts for, the science, for science and made connections through amateur science clubs like the Lunar Society. There were only the, be there were only the beginnings of an indication that they saw themselves as a new class. Arkwright's lifelong ambition was to join the ranks of the gentry. Wilkinson was an improving landlord. The Darbys incorporated farming into their increasingly vast operation to supply horses for railways and wagon teams and sold clover, wheat, barley, bark, horses, and sheep. The success of the Darbys had depended upon innovation, but generation, excuse me, one generation building upon the advances and insights of the previous generation. By the end of the century, the Darby Works would produce an excess of 13,000 tons of iron per annum, an increase of 25-fold since the time of the first Darby. The pioneering capitalists of the Industrial Revolution displayed a remarkable capacity for self-reproduction in terms of passing on their works to sons bearing the same name. Thus, the second generation of industrialists included Richard Arkwright II, Josiah Wedgwood II, Josiah Spode II, James Watt II, and Matthew Bolton II. 
The Soho foundry was taken over by the sons of Bolton and Watt as intended with Murdoch's aid. In the case of the Darbys, Abraham Darby III and Samuel Darby, who died in 1789 and 1796 respectively, passed Colebrookdale on to the fourth generation. Francis Darby, Edmund Darby, and Abraham Darby IV. These second, third, and fourth generations of the early masters would go on to articulate the interests of industrialists in a more certain expression of a class. But their fathers did combine in order to attempt to influence policy according to a perceived common interest. It was Samuel Garbett who spearheaded the General Chamber of Manufacturers, an early lobby group, which was perhaps the first attempt by the manufacturer to seek to influence policy separate from the mercantile interest. Acting on a, quote, general conviction that the ministry was hopelessly ignorant of the problems of industry and foreign trade, end quote, Garbett sought to organize manufacturers to press for a commercial treaty with the newly independent United States in 1782. Only a loose federation was ever achieved put under the presidency of Josiah Wedgwood. Garbett and Wedgwood soon split over the decision of whether to make concessions and work with Pitt's ministry, which Garbett favored or signed with the opposition as Wedgwood preferred. This schism persisted in discussions over the signing of a commercial treaty with France in 1786, with the opposing faction arguing that the only industries to benefit would be those that enjoyed the advantages of technological superiority, speculation and credit, such as Manchester's cotton masters, whilst the older industries, quote, firmly established on the solid foundations of the English agricultural economy, end quote, such as Bristol's brass trade, would lose their protective tariffs and be exposed to ruin from foreign competition. Such a schism attests to the fact that, by and large, capitalist entrepreneurs were still a type and not a class. The chamber soon fell apart, but regional associations continued, and this first attempt was only the beginnings of an increasingly, quote, class-conscious, end quote, group of industrialists whose power rested in the control of capital. <laughs> As we shall see, it would be, take several decades before the first efforts to establish organizations representing a working class in general. In the form of the cross-trade combinations or trades unions, not to be confused with single industry trade unions, every economy is but the ensemble of that society's social reproduction, which is realized in specific social forms and foundations that are never universal or simply natural. The development of a capitalist economy may be implied by the dominance of a certain set of interests with a powerful intrinsic logic, such as the drive to transform production in accordance with market competition. But the social relationships of capitalism still must be realized in society, and in society there were and are powerful interests capable of mounting significant resistance to the introduction or imposition of the social property relation of capital. That's the end of the chapter, and it's the end of part two. Now we move on next time to part three, Customs Last Stand, the rise and fall of artisan-led resistance to capitalism in England, 1783 to 1848. And that chapter, which is chapter 10, is titled Custom and Law. <laughs>